Welcome to Classics on Twitch. Today the players present a performance of Shakespeare's Hamlet. First staged sometime between 1599 and 1602, the tragedy of Hamlet is Shakespeare's longest play. The tale follows the doomed prince Hamlet of Denmark in his attempt to avenge his father's murder. The play also tells the tale of the complex political struggles of medieval Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. The play examines the psychology of murder, politics, devotion, and madness. The stage is set. The players are ready. Let us join them in Elsinore for the tragedy of Hamlet. everyone and welcome welcome to our production of hamlet thank you all for being here we are going to have a lot of fun with this we hope that you all enjoy us as well we're going to go around and introduce everybody and then i will do the spiel everybody's in the right place yay um starting we'll go clockwise lauren good morning thank you for being here Good morning, everyone. I'm Lauren. I'm that salty ginger over on Twitter and half of Salty Sweet Games with my best friend Kiana here on Twitch. I use she, her pronouns, and today I get to read Hamlet. Hmm. <laughs> sorry. That's all. I, I, I'm not sorry. I'm happy you don't read Hamlet. Uh, <laughs> and then, oh, look, it's a face I haven't seen over a week. Trooper, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. I, I I missed you last week. That's all. And, uh, but I'm Trooper SJP, and I'm happy to be here because I get to see two of my super big buddies who I don't normally get to see because my character has been trapped in a stone and will be probably for an entire season. But uh, I'm happy to be here. I, I love this crew. Um, I love classics on Twitch, and I'm excited to uh, do some Hamlet. Because, I mean, I feel like Denmark's the place to be. Well, it's definitely a place to be. Um, <laughs> welcome, welcome. And then next, skipping me, Billy. Hey, good morning. Thank you again. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Going to have a really good time. Uh, if you like the internet, you can find me at Bill of the Forest on Twitter. Um, if you don't, uh, don't worry about it. Um, thank you, Billy. And then Tanya, Tanya, thank you for being hello. here. You're so welcome. Thanks for inviting me because, uh, fun fact that people may not know, I was a big uh, Shakespeare nerd in high school thanks to my homeroom teacher. And every year we would do a play and wander through the halls and doing Julius Caesar was probably my most fun running around um, as as Caesar and giving the and also giving uh, God what is a speech friends Romans countrymen mm -hmm. yeah so Brutus. that was a lot of fun in high school Brutus uh, but yes I'm Cypher Terror online um, I'm very lucky to play with Deidre in Dragon Age and uh, Sunday because today is Friday I had to check. Um, I'll be on Rivals Waterdeep in our season six finale. So find me over there at twitch.tv backslash DD on Sunday. So, yeah. and I get to be the Hamlet, not the Hamlet, but be in the Hamlet. So, yay. I don't want to be the Hamlet. Bad things happen. No, you get to be Spoilers. the best character in the play. I, I, my favorite, anyways. And last yeah, but yeah. certainly not least, he of the dulcet tones. Thank you again, Pope, for that wonderful introduction that we do appreciate that you do them for us. Thank you for being uh, here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, happy to, to introduce some classics. And, oh, again, this is like going into a time machine and meeting up with super angsty 13-year-old me. Um, and just seeing all the, the sadness, angst, murder, betrayal, poisoning. I mean, this thing's got everything. And I'm so happy to be here. Yes, indeed. Everything and anything you could possibly want. And for those, welcome. If you this is your first time joining us live, we happy to have you. Um, we do have a couple things that we like to get out of the way. First of all, um, 
because the wonders of the internet means that we can all want to be on the same script and not have different editions or have different things. So we, and we also want to know that sometimes it's hard to follow. So we want you to be able to follow along at home. So uh, exclamation point script will bring up the link to open source Shakespeare. That is a wonderful resource for you to use. Um, it's the same script that the cast is using. And we also understand, uh, we also understand that sometimes there are a lot of people in these plays and it's kind of hard to keep them all track. So we have a command for a character, which will give you, link you over to our friends over at Sparknotes, who are a hashtag, none of these are sponsored, but I love them, so whatever, um, which are a wonderful resource to use that will help you find, keep track of everybody. Also, this is where I put on my teacher's cap and say, hey students, your teachers will know if your only source is Sparknotes, use at least one more. Just throwing that out there. And, and then, also not Wikipedia, just just because that's not that's don't don't that's not okay. an authored source. Use the sources Wikipedia list. Yes. And and I will give you a reason. And this is the reason why you should never use Wikipedia because I may have had friends at Georgia Tech who may or may not have spent an expended amount of time making minor changes to things in Wikipedia articles just for the lulls, like inversing dates and seeing how long it would take people to correct them. So please don't use Wikipedia. It is not a valid source. Um, but we also like to say that um, these are full, unabridged scripts. And while Bill Shakespeare gave us some beautiful moments, some heart-wrenching moments, some beautiful looks into human identity and, and, and speeches, he's also very much a product of his time and has some less than... Uh, uh, statements and opinions. So we like to thank Bill for his less than great um, word choice at times and making sure that we are all following and doing everything great. But I believe that is everything from me. So let us begin with Act 1, Scene 1. Elsinore, a platform before the castle. Enter two sentinels. First, Francisco who paces up and down at his post, and then Bernardo, who approaches him. Who's there? Uh, nay, answer me. Stand in and fold yourself. Long live the king! Bernardo? He? You are cold and I am sick at heart. Have you had a quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them t make haste. Enter Horatio and Marcellus. I, I think I hear them. Stand ho, who's there? Friends to this ground. Uh, and liegeman to the Dane. Uh, give you good night. Oh, farewell, honest soldier. Uh, who hath relieved you? Uh, a piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What? Has, has this thing appeared to, again tonight? I've seen nothing. Horatio says tis but our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight twice, twice seen of us. Therefore, I have entered him, I've entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Tush, tush, twill not appear. Sit down a while, and let us once again assail your ears. They are so fortified against our story, what we two knights have seen. Well, sit me down, and let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star, as westward from the pole, had made his course to loom that part of heaven where now it burns, ourselves and myself, the bell then beating one. Peace! Break the off. Look, look where it comes again. The same figure, like the king's that's dead. Thou art our scholar. Speak to it, Horatio. Look it not like the king? Mark it, Horatio. Most like. It heroes me of fear and wonder. It would be spoke to. Question it, question it, Horatio. What art thou that usurps this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form, in which the majesty of buried Denmark did sometimes march? By heaven I charge thee, speak. gone and will not answer how now horatio you tremble and look pale 
Is not this something more than fantasy? What think you want? Before, my god, I might not disbelieve, but that the sense went true a vouch of mine own eyes. Is it not like the king? As thou art to thyself. Such was the very armor he had on when he, the ambitious Norway, combated. So frowned he once when, in an angry parley, he smote the sledded polax on the ice. Tis strange. Thus twice before, and jump at this dead hour, with martial stock hath he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work I know not, but in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Good now. Sit down, and tell me, he that knows, why this same strict, why such impressive shipwrights, whose sore task does not divide the Sunday from the week? What might be toward that this sweaty haste doth make? Whose image even now but appeared to us was, as you know, by Fortinbras of Norway, there to you pricked on by most emulate pride, dared to the combat, in which our most valiant Hamlet for so the side of our known world esteemed him, did slay this Fortinbras, who by a sealed compact, while ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit with his life all those his lands which he stood seized, of to the conqueror, against which a moiety competent was gauged by our king, which has returned to the inheritance of Fortinbras, had he been vanquisher, as by the same covenant and carriage of the article designed, his fell to Hamlet. Now, sir, young Fortinbras, of unimproved metal hot and full, hath in the skirts of Norway here and there, shucked up a list of lawless resolutes for food and diet to some enterprise that hath a stomach in it, which is no other, as it doth well appear into our state. But to recover of us by strong hand in terms compulsory, compulsory those forsaid lands so by his father lost and this, I take it, is the main motive of our preparations, the source of this our watch, and the chief head of his post haste and romage in the land. I think it be no other than been in so. Well, may it sort that this portentous figure comes on through our watch, so like the king that was and is the question of these wars. A mode it is to trouble the mind's eye, in the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell. The graves to tenantless, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets. As stars with trains of fire and dews of blood, disasters in the sun, and the moist star upon whose influence Neptune's empire stands was sick almost to doomsday with eclipse, and even like precursor fierce events, as harbingers preceding still the fates and prologue to the omen coming on, have heaven and earth together demonstrated unto our climature and countrymen. Lo, the ghost enters again. But soft, behold, lo, where it comes again. I'll cross it, though, blast me. Stay, illusion. If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If there be, be any good thing to be done, that may do, that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. If thou art privy to the country's fate, which happily for knowing may avoid, O oh, speak. Or if thou hast uphoarded in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth for which they say you spirits off walk in death a cock crows speak of it stay and speak stop it marcellus shall i strike it with my partisan do if it will not stand tis here tis here oh no tis gone we, we do it wrong being so majestical to offer it the show of violence for it is as the air, invulnerable, and our vain glows malicious mockery. I was about to speak when the cock crew. And then it started like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons. I've heard the cock, that is the trumpet to the morn, doth with his lofty and shrill sounding throat, awake the god of day, and at his warning, whether in sea or fire, in earth or air, the extravagant and erring spirit hies to his confine. Of the truth herein, this present object made probation. It faded on the curring of the cock. Some say that ever, against that season comes wherein our Savior's birth is celebrated, the bird of dawning singeth all night long. And, th and then they say, no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome, then no planet strike, no fairy takes, nor which hath power to charm, so hallowed and so hallowed and so gracious is the time. 
so I've heard and do in part believe it. But look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon east, yon high eastward hill. Break, break we our march up, and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet. For upon my life, the spirit dumb to us will speak to him. Do you consent we shall acquaint him with it, as needful in our loves, fitting in our duty? Let's do it, I pray, and I this morning know where we shall find him most conveniently. Excellent. Act one, scene two. Elsinore, a room of state in the castle. <laughs> Enter Claudius, king of Denmark, Gertrude, the queen, Hamlet, Polonius, Laertes, and his sister Ophelia, Multiman, Cornelius, lords, attendant. Because everybody needs a shit ton of lords. Oh, yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it is befitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him. Together with remembrance of ourselves, therefore our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we, as twere, with a defeated joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. Nor have we herein barred your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along. For all our thanks. Now follows that you know young Fortinbra, holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death, our state to be disjoint and out of frame. Colleagued with this dream of his advantage, he hath not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of these lands, lost by his father with all bands of law to our most valiant brother. So much for him. Now for ourself and for this time of meeting, thus much the business is. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbra, who, impotent and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose, to suppress his further gate herein, in that the levies, the lists, and full proportions are all made out of his subject. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, Voltamand, for bearers of this greeting to old Norway, giving to you no further personal power to business with the king, more than the scope of these dilated articles allow. Farewell, and let your haste command your duty. Well, in all that, and all things, we show our duty. Oh, we doubted nothing. Heartily farewell. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. Was, was it Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane and lose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes? Thou shall not be my offer, not thy asking. The head is more native to the heart the hand more instrumental to the mouth than is the throne of Denmark to my father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? My dread lord, your leave in favor to return to France, from whence the willingly I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation. Yet now I, I must confess that duty done, my, my thoughts and wishes bend again towards France and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave by laboursome petition, and at last, upon his will, I sealed my hard consent. I do beseech you, give will. But now, my cousin Hamlet and my son. A little more than kin and less than kind. How is it the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord, I am too much of the sun. Oh, good Hamlet. Cast thy knighted color off, and, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek thy noble father in the dust. Thou, if it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam, nay, it is, I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black 
nor windy suspiration of forced breath. No, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected havior of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play, but I have that within which paths show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. It is sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these mourning duties to your father. But you must know now, your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persevere in obstinate condolment is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. It shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and schooled for what we now must be and is as common as any the most vulgar thing to sense. Why should we in our peevish opposition uh, take it to heart? Fie, tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, whose common thing we pray you throw to earth this unprevailing woe and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne and with no less nobility of love that which dearest father bears his son do I impart toward you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire. And we beseech you, Bend you to remain here in the cheer. Please stay with us, Gay. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, tis a loving and fair reply, be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come, this gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. In grace whereof, no jocund health that Denmark drinks today, but the king but the great cannon to the clouds shall tell, and the king's ruse, the heaven shall brew it again. For speaking earthly thunder, come away. Exit all but Hamlet. That this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew or that the everlasting had not fixed his can against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie on it, fie. Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed, things rank and gross in nature possess it merely, that it should come to this. But two months dead, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this, Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven, visit her face too roughly, heaven and earth, must I remember why she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on and yet within a month, let me not think on it. frailty, thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old, with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, even she, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason, would have mourned longer, married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules, within a month. Ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Anta, Horatio, Marcellus, and Bernardo. Hail to your lordship. I am glad to see you well. Horatio, or I do forget myself. The same, my lord, and your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, 
I'll change that name with you. Uh, what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Uh, Marcellus? My good lord. I am very glad to see you. Uh, good even, sir. But what in faith make you from Wittenberg? A truant disposition, good, my lord. I would not hear your enemy say so, nor shall you do my ear that violence to make it truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are no truant, but what is your affair in Elsinore? We'll teach you to drink deep ere you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I prithee do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio, the funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven, or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. My father, methinks I see my father. Oh, where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man, take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. Saw? Who? My lord, the king, your father. The king, my father. Season your admiration for a while with an attent ear, till I may deliver upon the witness of these gentlemen's marvel to you. For God's love, let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch. In the dead vast in the middle of the night, been thus encountered, a figure like your father, armed at point exactly, cap a pay, appears before them and with solemn march goes slowly and stately by them. Thrice he walked by their oppressed and fierce surprised eyes with, within his truncheon's length, whilst they distilled almost to jelly with the act of fear. Stand dumb and speak not to him. This to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did. And I with them the third night kept the watch, whereas they delivered both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good. The apparition comes, I knew your father, these hands are not more like. But where was this? Marcellus, where was this? Um, my lord, upon the platform where we watched. Did you not speak to it? My lord, I did, but answer made it none. Yet once methought it lifted up its head and did address itself to motion like as it would speak. But even then the morning cock crew loud, and at the sound it shrunk in haste away and vanished from our sight. Tis very strange. As I do live, my honored lord, tis true. And we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed, indeed, sirs, but this troubles me. Hold you watch tonight? We do, my lord. My lord. Uh, armed, you say you? Uh, armed, armed, my lord. From top to toe? My lord, my lord from, from head, head to, foot. to foot. Then saw you not his face? Oh, yes, my lord. He wore his beaver up. What, look, he, looked he frowningly? A countenance more in sorrow than in anger. Pale or red? Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. I would I had been there. It would have much amazed you. Very like, very like. Stayed it long? While one with moderate haste might tell a hundred. Longer. Longer. Not when I saw it. His beard was frizzled, no? It was, as I've seen it in his life, a sable silvered. I will watch tonight. Perchance we'll walk again. I want it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. And whatsoever else shall hap tonight, give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves, so fare you well. Upon the platform twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. Our duty to, Our your, duty honor. to your honor. Your loves is mine to you. Farewell. My father's spirit and arms, all is not well. I doubt some foul play, would the night were come. Till then sit still, my soul, foul deeds will rise, though all the earth o'erwhelm them to men's eyes. 
Act 1, Scene 3. Elsinore, a room in the house of Polonius. Enter Laertes and Ophelia. My necessaries are embarked. Farewell. And sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistant, do not sleep, but let me hear from you. Do you doubt that? Huh. For Hamlet, in the trifling of his favor, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violet in the youth of primy nature, forward not permanent, sweet not lasting, the perfume and suppliance of a minute, not more. No more but so. I think it no more, for nature crescent does not grow alone and fuse in bulk, but as this temple waxes, the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide withal. Perhaps, perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor cottle does, does dismirch the virtue of his will, but you must fear his greatness weighed. His, his will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and health of, of this whole state, and therefore must his choice be circumscribed, circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body whereof he is the head. Then, if he says he loves you, it fits your wisdom so far to believe it as he, is, as he in his particular act and place may give his saying heed, which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes with all then weigh what loss your honor may sustain if with too credent ear you list his songs or, or lose your heart or, or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister, and keep you in the rear of your affection out of the shot and danger of desire. The cheriest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon. Virtue itself scopes not calumnous strokes. The canker galls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed, and in the morn and liquid dew of youth, contagious blastments are in most imminent. Be wary, then. Best safety lies in fear. Youth to itself rebels, though none else near. I shall affect I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But, good my brother, do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, while, a, like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own reed. Oh, fear me not. Oh, <clears throat> I stay too long, but here my father comes. A double blessing is a double grace. Occasion smiles upon a second leaf. Yet here, there it is. Abroad, abroad, for shame! The wind sits in the shoulder of your sail and you stayed for. There, my blessing with thee. And these few precepts in thy memory, look thou character. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any apportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast and their adoption tried, grapple unto thy soul with hoops of steel, but do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched, unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear that thy opposed be may beware of thee. Give every man thine ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but preserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit, as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy. Rich, not gaudy. For the apparel oft proclaims man, and they in France of the best rank and station are most select and generous, chief in one. Neither a borrower nor a lender be. Cologne oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. It is above all to thine own self be true. And it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell. My blessing season this in thee. Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. 
The time invites you. Go, your servants tend. Farewell, Ophelia. And remember well what I've said to you. Uh, tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Farewell. What is Ophelia he hath said to you? Uh, so please you, uh, something touching the Lord Hamlet. Very well bethought. Just told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself have of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, as so it is put on me, and without any way of caution, I must tell you, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behooves my daughter and your honor. What is between you? Give me up the truth. Uh, he hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? Oh. You speak like a green girl, unsifted in such perilous circumstances. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? Uh, I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Mary, I will teach you. Thank yourself a baby that you have taken these tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. Tender yourself more dearly, or not to crack the wind of the poor phrase running it thus. You'll tender me a fool. Uh, my lord, he hath importuned me with love in an honorable fashion. I fashion you may call go to, go to. And hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, uh, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Ha! <laughs> Springes to catch woodcocks. I do know when the blood burns how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. These blazes, daughter, giving more light than heart, extincting both, even in their promise as it is a making, you must not take for fire. From this time, be something scanter of your maiden presence. Set your own treatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. For Lord Hamlet, believe him so much in him that he is young. With a larger tether he may walk, then may be given you. But few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows. For they are brokers, not of that dye which their investments show, but mere implorators of unholy suits. Breathing like sanctified and pious bonds, the better to beguile them. This is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words of talk with the Lord, Lord Hamlet? Look to it, I charge you. Come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. Act one, scene four. Elsinore, the platform before the castle. Enter Hamlet, Horatio, and Marcellus. The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks a 12. No, it, it is struck. Indeed, I heard it not. Then it draws near the season wherein the spirit held his wont to talk. <laughs> what does this mean, my lord? The king doth wake tonight and takes his brows. Keeps wassail and swaggering upspring reels, and as he drains his draughts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and trumpet thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? I, Marius, but to my mind, though I am native here and to the manner born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. This heavy handed rebel east and west makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They clip us drunkards and with swinish phrase soil our addition. And indeed it takes from our achievements, though performed at height, the pith and marrow of our attribute. So oft it chances in particular men that for some vicious mole of nature in them, as in their birth, wherein they are not guilty, since nature cannot choose his origin, by the or growth of some complexion, oft breaking down the pales and forts of reason, or by some habit that too much or leavens, the form of close of manners, that these men, carrying, I say, the stamp of one defect, being nature's livery or fortune's star, 
their virtues else, be they as pure as grace, as infinite as man may undergo, shall in the general censure take corruption from that particular fault. The dram of ile doth all the noble substance often doubt to his own scandal. Look, my lord, it comes. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. Bring with thee airs from heavens or blasts from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet. King, father, royal Dane, oh, answer me. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hearsed in death, have burst their cerements, why this sepulchre, wherein we saw thee quietly inured, hath oped his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again. What may this mean, that thou, dead course again in complete steel, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous and we fools of nature so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls? Say, why is this? Wherefore, what should we do? It beckons you to go away with it, as if it's some import impartment to desire to you alone. Look, with what courteous action it, it waves you to a more removed ground. But, but do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why? What should be the fear? I do not set my life at a pin's fee. And for my soul, what can it do to that, being a thing immortal as itself? It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempts you toward the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles are as base into the sea? And there seems some other horrible form which might deprive you, which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness. Think of it. The very place puts toys of desperation without more motive into every brain that looks so many fadoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It waves me still. Go on, I'll follow thee. You, you shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands. Be ruled, you shall not go. My fate cries out and makes each petty artery in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Still am I called, unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. I say away. Go on, I'll follow thee. He waxes desperate with imagination. <sighs> Let's follow. Tis not fit thus to obey him. Have after. To what issue will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Nay, let's follow him. Act 1, scene 5. Elsinore, the castle, another part of the fortifications. Enter the ghost and Hamlet. Whither wilt thou lead me? Speak, I'll go no further. Hark me. I will. My hour is almost come. When I, to sulfurous and tormenting flames, must render up myself. Alas, poor ghost. Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge, when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast and fires. The foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away, but that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house. I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars, start from the spheres, thy knotted and combined locks depart, and each particular hair stand on end, like quills upon fretful porcupine, but this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood, list, list, list. 
Now they have an idea father love. Oh, God. Revenge is foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul, as in the best it is. But this most foul is strange of the natural. Haste me to know it, that I, with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love, may sweep to my revenge. A find being apt. And Dello, shouldst thou be then the fat weed that walks itself in ease on leth wall? Wouldst thou not stir in this? Now. Hamlet, here. It is given out that sleeping in my orchard, a serpent stung me. So the whole ear of Denmark is by a forged process of my death, rankly abused. But no, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. My prophetic soul, my uncle. I, that incestuous, that adulterate beast with witchcraft of his wit, with traitor's gifts, O oh, wicked wit and gifts that have the power so to seduce one to his shameful lust that will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there from me, whose love was of that dignity, that it went to aunt in hand, and even with thy vow I made to her marriage and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine. But virtue, as it never will be moved through lewdness caught in it a shape of heaven. So lust, though to a radiant angel lint, forsake itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. But soft, methinks I sense the morning air. Brief let me be. Sleeping within my orchard, my custom always of the afternoon. Upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with juice of cursed heaven in a vial, and in the porches of my ears did pour the leprous distillment, whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man that swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body with a sudden vigor it doth possess the curd like eager droppings into milk with thin and wholesome blood. So did it mine, and most instant had it barked about, most laser-like, with vile and loathsome crust all my smooth body. Thus was I sleeping, by a brother's hand of life of crown and queen, at once dispatched, cut off even in the bosoms of my sin, unhoused, disappointed and unailed, no reckoning made, but to sent to my account with all my imperfections upon my head. Oh, horrible, horrible, most horrible. If thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But howsoever thou purest this act, Taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother art. Leave her to heaven, and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge to prick and sting her. Fare thee well at once. The glowworm shows the mating to be near, and begins to pale his unreflectual fire. Adieu, adieu, adieu. Remember me. Oh, you host of heaven. Oh, earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? Hold, hold my heart. 
And you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee. I, thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, remember thee. Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter, yes, by heaven. Oh, most pernicious woman, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. My table's neat, it is, I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I am sure it may be so in Denmark. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word, it is, do you, do you remember me? I have sworn it. My lord, my lord, Lord Hamlet. Heaven secure him. So be it. Hello, ho, ho, my lord. Hello, ho, ho, boy, come, bird, come. How, how is my noble lord? What news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Good, my lord, tell it. No, you will reveal it. Not I, my lord, by heaven. Uh, nor I, my lord. How say you then? Would heart of man once think it? But you'll be secret. I, I by heaven, I have my, lord. my lord. There's ne'er a villain dwelling in all Denmark, but he's an arrant knave. There needs no ghost, my lord. Come from the grave to tell us this. <laughs> I right. You are in the right. And so, without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You, as your business and desire shall point you, for every man hath business and desire, such as it is, and for my own poor part, Look you, I'll go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I am sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith, heartily. There's no offense, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is a ratio. And much offense, too, touching this vision here. It is an honest ghost, that let me tell you. For your desire to know what is between us, or master it as you may. And now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars, and soldiers, give me one poor request. What is it, my lord? We will. Never make known what you have seen tonight. But my lord, my lord, we will not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. Nor I, my lord, in faith. Upon my sword. We have sworn, my lord, already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Swear. <gasps> Why sayest thou so? Art thou there, true Benny? Come on, you hear this fellow in the cellarage? Consent to swear. Propose the oath, my propose the oath, my lord. Never to speak of this that you have seen. Swear by my sword. Swear. He get to beak. Then we'll shift our ground. Come hither, gentlemen, and lay your hands again upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard. Swear by my sword. Swear by his sword. Well said, old mole, gets work in the earth so fast. A worthy pioneer. Once more, remove, good friends. Oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, here as before, never, so help you mercy. How strange or odd soe'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you, at such time seeing me, never shall, with arms encumbered thus, or this head shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase as, well, well, we know, or we couldn't if we would, or if we list to speak, or there be an if they might, or such ambiguous giving out to note that you know aught of me, this is not to do. So grace and mercy at your most need help you. Swear. Swear. We swear. Rest, rest, perturbed spirit. So, gentlemen, with all my love, I do commend me to you. And what so poor a man as Hamlet is, may do it to express his love and friending to you. God willing shall not lack. Let us go in together. 
and still your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. Cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. Nay, come, let's let's go together. Act two, scene one. Alcinar, a room in the house of Polonius. Enter Polonius and Reynaldo. Give him this money and these notes, Reynaldo. I will, my lord. You shall do marvels wisely, good Reynaldo, before you visit him, to make inquire of his behavior. My lord, I did intend it. Very well said, very well said. Look you, sir. Inquire me first what Danskers are in Paris. And now, and who, what means, and where they keep. What company, and what expense. Finding by this encompassment and drifts in question that they do know my son, come you more nearer. And your particular demands will touch it. Take you, as for some distant knowledge of him, and thus I know his father and his friends, and in part him. Do you mark this, Ronaldo? Aye, very well, my lord. And in part him, but you may say, not well. But if he be he mean, he's very wild, addicted, so and so. And there put on him what forgeries you please, Mary, none so rank as may dishonor him. Take heed of that. But, sir, such wanton, wild, and unusual slips as our companions noted and most known to youth and liberty. As gaming, my lord. Aye, or drinking, fencing, swearing, quarreling, drabbing. You may go so far. My lord, that would dishonor him. Faith? No. As you may season it in the charge. You must not put another scandal on him. That he is open to incontinency. That's not my meaning. But breathe his faults so quaintly that they may seem the taints of liberty. The flash and outbreak of a fiery mind, a savageness of unreclaimed blood, or general assault. But, my good lord, I... Wherefore shall you do this? I, my lord, I would know that. Mary, sir, here's my trip. And I believe it is fetch of warrant, you laying these slight sullies on my son, as a little thing, a little soiled, the working mark you. The party in converse, him you would sound, having ever seen in the predominant crimes the youth you breathe of guilty. Be assured, he closes with you in this consequence, good sir, or so, to, or friend, or gentleman, according to the phrase or the addition of man and country. Very good, my lord. And then, sir, does a, a this, a does. What was I about to say? And by the mass, I was about to say something. Where did I leave? At closes in the consequence, at friend or so, and gentleman. At closes in the consequence. I may. He closes thus. Mm. I know the gentleman. I saw him yesterday or the other day, or then or then with such and such. And, and as you say, there was a gaming there or took in throws. Mm -hmm. They're following out a tennis mm -hmm. or perchance. I saw him into a house of sale. Mm -hmm. uh, did all the select brothel and so forth. See you now. Yep. Your bait of falsehood takes this cop of truth. And thus do we of wisdom and of reach with windlasses and with says of bias by indirections find directions out. <laughs> so by my formal lecture and advice, shall you, my son, you have me, have you not? Cop of truth. My lord, I have. God, buy ye well. Fare ye well. Good, my lord. Observe his inclination yourself. I shall, my lord. And let him play his music. Well, my lord. Farewell. Oh, now, Ophelia, what's the matter? Oh, my lord. My lord, I have been so affrighted. With what? In the name of God. My lord, as I was sewing in my closet, uh, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all unbraced, no hat upon his head, his, his stockings fouled, ungartered, and down gift to his ankle, pale as his shirt, 
his knees knocking each other with, with a look so piteous in purport as if he had been loosed out of hell. To speak of horrors, he comes before me. Mad for thy love? My lord, I, I do not know, but truly, I do fear it. What said he? He, he took me by the wrist and held me hard, then goes he a length of all his arm, and with his other hand or his brow he falls at such perusal of my face as he would draw it. Long stayed he so, at, at last a, a little shaking of my arm, and thrice his head thus waved up and down, raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and, and his being. That done, he lets me go, and with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes, for out of doors he went without their help, and to the last he bended their light on me. Come, go with me. I'll go seek the king. This is the very ecstasy of love, whose violent poverty foretells itself. He leads the will to desperate overtakings as oft as any passion of the heaven that does afflict our natures. I am, I am sorry. What, have you given him any hard words of late? Uh, no, my good lord, but as you did command, I did repel his letters and, and denied his access to me. Oh, that hath made him mad. I'm sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not quoted him. I feared he did but trifle, meant to rack thee, but shrew my jealousy. By heaven, as it is proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions, as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. Come, go we to the king. This must be known, which, being kept close, might move more grief to hide than hate our to our other love. Come. Act two, scene two. Elsinore, a room in the castle. <laughs> Enter. The king and queen, Rosencrantz and Guildenstone, cum aliis, which means with others, just more. Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, uh, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation, so I call it? Sith nor the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was what it should be, more than his father's death that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. I entreat you both that being of so young days brought up with him and since so neighbored to his youth and behavior that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time so by your companies, to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather so much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus that opened lies within our remedy. Good gentlemen, he hath much talked of me, and sure I am two men there are not living to whom he more adheres. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and goodwill as to expend your time with us a while for the supply and profit of our hope. Your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Both your majesties might by the sovereign power you have of us, but your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty. But we both obey. And here give up ourselves in the full bents, to lay our service freely at your feet, to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern and, and gentle Rosencrantz. And I beseech you instantly to visit my, my too much changed son. Go, some of you, and, and, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Aye. Amen. Exit. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, with some of the attendants. Enter Polonius. The ambassadors from Norway, my good lord, are joyfully returned. Hmm, thou still hast been the father of good news. Have I, my lord? 
I'll show you my good leash. I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my God and to my gracious king. Mm. I do think, or else this brain of mine hunts not the trail of force so sure as it has us to do, that I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that. That do I long to hear. Give first amends to the ambassadors. My news shall be the fruit of that great feast. Mm -hmm. Thyself do grace to them and bring them in. He tells me, my dear Gertrude, he hath found the head and source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it is no other but the main, his father's death and our, our oh, hasty marriage. Well, we will sift him. Enter Polonius, Mortiman, and Cornelius. Welcome, my good friends. Say, Voltamand, what from our brother Norway? Most fair return of greetings and desires. Upon our first, he sent out to suppress his nephew's levies, which to him appeared to be a preparation against the Polak, but better looked into, he truly found it was against your highness, whereat grieved that so his sickness and age and impotence was falsely born in hand, sends out arrests on Fortinbras, which he, in brief, obeys, receives rebukes from Norway, and in fine, makes vow before his uncle never more to give the assay of arms against your majesty, whereon old Norway, overcome with joy, gives him three thousand crowns in annual fee, and to, and his commission to employ those soldiers so levied as before against the Polak, with an entreaty herein further shown. Gives him a favour. That it might please you to give quiet pass through your domain dominions for this enterprise on such regards of safety and allowance as therein are set down. It likes us well, and at our mere considered time we'll read, answer, and think upon this business. Meantime, we thank you for your well took labor. Go to your rest, at night we'll feast together. Most welcome home. Excellent, ambassadors. This business is well ended, my liege and madam. To expostulate, what majesty should be, what do he is? What day is day, night is night, and time is time. Uh, nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of width and tedious the limbs and this outward flourish, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it, for to define true madness. What is but to be nothing else but mad, but let that go. More matter with less art. Madam, I swear I use no art at all, that he is mad. This true, this true, tis pity, and pity tis, tis true, a foolish figure. But well, farewell it, for I will use no art. Mad, let us grant him then. And now remains that we find the cause of this effect, or rather say, the cause of this defect. For effect defective comes by this cause, thus I remains and remain and thus prepend. I have a daughter. Have while she is mine, who in her duty obedient spark hath given me this. Now, Gather and surmise. To the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia. It's a new phrase, a wild phrase, beautified, wild phrase. But you shall hear this. In her excellent white bosom, these. Mm. <clears throat> Came this from Hamlet to her? Good madam, stay a while, I will be faithful. Doubt the stars of fire, doubt that the sun doth move, doubt that truth be a liar, but never doubt I love. O oh, dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers, I have not art to reckon my groans, but that I love thee best, O oh, most best, believe it adieu. Die evermore, most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him, Hamlet. This in obedience hath my daughter shown me, and more above hath his solicitings as the fill out by time, by means, by place, all given to mine ear. But how hath she received his love? 
What do you think of me? As of a man faithful and honorable. I would fain prove so, but what might you think when I had seen this hot love on the wing? As I perceived it, I must tell you that before my daughter told me. What might you, all my dear majesty, your queen here, think if I played the desk or the table book or given my heart a winking, mute and dumb, or looked upon this love with idle sight? What might you think? No, I went round to work, and my young mistress thus I did bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince. Out of thy star, this must not be. And then I prescripts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens. Which done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repulsed, a short tale to make, fell into sadness, and then into a fast, thence to a watch, thence to a weakness, thence to a lightness, then by the clinching into madness, wherein now he raves, and all we mourn for. Do you think tis this? It may be. Very like. Hath there been such a time, I would fain know the act, that I have possibly said tis so, when it proved otherwise. Not that I know. Take this from this, if this be otherwise. If circumstance lead me, I will find wherein the truth is hid, and though it were hid indeed within the center. How may we try it further? You know, sometimes he walks for hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. At such time, I'll loose my daughter to you. Be you and I behind the rast then. Mark the encounter. If he love her not, and he not from his reason born thereon, let me be no assistant for a state, but keep a farm and carters. Hmm. We will try it. Uh, Enter look, was... Ham Hamlet reading a book. But look where sadly the poor wretch comes reading. Away, I do beseech you, both away. Board him presently, or give me leave. How does my good lord Hamlet? Oh, God of mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent. Well, you are a fishmonger. Uh, not I, my lord. Then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? I, sir, to be honest as this world goes, is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. That's very true, my lord. For if the sun bring maggots and a dead dog, being a god kissing carrion, have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. Friend, look to it. How say you by that? Still hearken on my daughter, yet he knew me not at first. He said I was a fishmonger. He is far gone, far gone. And truly in my youth I suffered much extremity for love. Very dear to us. I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words. 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 What is the matter, my lord? Between who? I, I mean, the matter that you read, my lord. Slanders, sir. For the satirical rogue says here that old men have gray beards and that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit together with most weak hands. All which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down. For you yourself, sir, should be old as I am, if, like a crab, you could go backward. Well, this be madness, yet there's some method in it. Will you walk out in the air, my lord? Into my grave. Indeed, that is out of the air. Our pregnant sometimes as replies are the happiness that often madness hits on, which reason and sanity could not so pr prosperously be delivered of. I will leave him in suddenly contrived means meeting between him and my daughter. 
Honorable Lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. Except my life. Except my life. Except my life. Enter Very Rosencrantz. Well, my lord. Enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. <sighs> These tedious old fools. You go seek the Lord Hamlet. There he is. God save you, sir. My honored lord. My most dear lord. My excellent good friend. How dost thou, Guildenstern? Rosencrantz, good lads, how do ye both? As the different children of the earth. Happy in that we are not over happy. On Fortune's camp we are not the very button. But nor the soles of her shoe. Neither, my lord. Then you live about her waist or in the middle of her favors? Faith, her privates we. Oh, in the secret parts of Fortune. Oh, most true, she is a strumpet. What news? None, my lord but that the world's grown honest. Then is doomsday near, but your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friend, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord? Denmark's the prison. It, then the world is one. A goodly one in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. Uh, we think not so, my lord. Why then, tis none to you, for there is nothing either good or bad but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Why then, your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. Which dreams indeed are ambition, for the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. A dream itself is but a shadow. Truly, and I hold ambition of so airy and like a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. Then are our beggars' bodies, and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggar shadows. <laughs> Shall we to the court, for by my fay I cannot reason? We'll wait upon you. No, no such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants, for to speak to you like an honest man, I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? To visit you, my lord. No other occasion. Beggar that I am, I am even poor in thanks. But I thank you. And sure, dear friends, my thanks are too dear a halfpenny. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, deal justly with me. Come, come, nay, speak. What should we say, my lord? Say anything but to the purpose. You were sent for, and there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to color. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. Ah, uh, to what end, my lord? That you must teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, by the consonancy of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love, and by what more dear, better proposer could charge you withal, be even and direct with me whether you were sent for or no. What say you? Nay, then, I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, we were sent for. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery and your secrecy to the king and queen molt no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why, it appeareth no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties and form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, 
the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. No, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. My lord, there was so much stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh then when I said man delights not me? I... <sighs> to think, my lord, if you delight not a man, what Lenten entertainment the players shall receive from you. We coated them on the way, and hither are they coming to offer your service. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. The adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. The lover shall not sigh gratis. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are tickle of the seer. And the lady shall say her mind freely, or the blank verse shall halt for it. What players are they? <sighs> Even those you were wont to take such delight in, the tragedians of the city. How chances that they travel? Their residence, both in reputation and profit, was better both ways. I think the inhibition comes by the means of the late innovation. Do they hold the same estimation they did when I was in the city? Are, are they so followed? No, indeed they are not. How comes it? Do they grow rusty? Nay, uh, their endeavor keeps in wanted pace. But there is, sir, uh, an eerie of children, little aises, that cry out on the top a question and are most tyrannically clapped for it. These are now the fashion. And so barrel the common stages, so they call them, and that wearing rapiers are afraid of goose quills and don't scarce come thither. What are they, children? Who maintains them? How are they escorted? Will they pursue the quality no longer than they can sing? Will they not stay afterwards if they should grow themselves to common players, as it is most like, if their means are no better? Their writers do them wrong to make them exclaim against their own succession. Faith, uh, there has been much to do on both sides, and the nation holds to no sin to tar than to controversy. There was, for a while, no money bid for arguments unless the poet and the player went to cuffs in question. <laughs> Is it possible? Oh, there's been much throwing about of brains. Do the boys carry it away? Oh, yeah, they do, my lord. Hercules and his load do. It is not very strange. For my uncle is king of Denmark, and those that would make mows at him while my father lived give 20, 40, 50, 100 ducats apiece for his picture and little. It's blood. There's something in this more than natural, if philosophy could find it out. <laughs> there are the players. Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands, come. The appurtenance of welcome is fashion and ceremony. Let me comply with you in this garb, lest my extent to the players, which I tell you must show fairly outwards, should more appear like entertainment than yours. You are welcome. But my uncle father and aunt mother are deceived. In, in what, my dear lord? I am but mad north northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a hand saw. Well, be with you, gentlemen. Hark you, Guildenstern, and you too at each year a hearer. That great baby you see there is not yet out of his swaddling clouts. I please the second time to come to them, for they say an old man is twice a child. I will prophesy he comes to tell me of the players. Mark it. You say right, sir, a Monday morning twas so indeed. My, my lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Roscius was an actor in Rome, the actors are come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon my honor. Then came each actor on his ass. The best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral, comical, pastoral, cool, pastoral, tragical, historical, tragical, comical, historical, pastoral, scene, individual, or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. For the law of Ricks and Liberty, these are the only men. Oh, Jephthah, judge of Israel, what a treasure hadst thou. What treasure had he, my lord? Why, one fair daughter and no more. 
the witch she loved it passing well. Still on my daughter. Am I not of the right, old Jephtha? If you call me Jephtha, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. Nay, that follows not. What follows then, my lord? Why, as by lot, God wot. And then, you know, it came to pass as most like it was. The first row of the pious chants and we'll show you more. For look where my abridgment comes. You are welcome, masters. Welcome all. I am glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. My old friend, why thy face is valent since I saw thee last. Comes out to beard me in Denmark. What, my young lady and mistress? My lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I last saw you, last by the altitude of a shop. Pray God, your voice like a piece of uncurrent gold be not cracked within the ring. Masters, you are all welcome. We'll into it like French falconers, fly at anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. Uh, what speech, my good lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was never acted, or if it was, not above once. For the play, I remember, pleased not the million. Twas caviary to the general, but it was as I received it, and others whose judgments in such matters cried in the top of mine, an excellent play, well digested in the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember one said, there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savory, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affectation, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. One speech in it I chiefly loved, twas Aeneas' tale to Dido, and thereabout of it, especially where he speaks of Priam's slaughter. If it live in your memory, begin at this line, um, let me see, let me see. The rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyrcanian beast, that tis not so, it, it, it begins with Pyrrhus. The rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the night resemble when he lay couched and the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal, head to foot, now is the total ghouls horridly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and empasted with the parching streets that lend a tyrannous and a damned light to their lord's murder, roasted in wrath and fire, and thus oarsized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire Priam seeks. For so God, proceed my, you. For God, my lord, well spoken, with good accent and good direct discretion. Oh, wow, I took Polonius's line. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> uh -huh. Too many peas. Yes, too many peas. Pierce, um, Priam, Polonius, player. Yeah. Uh, anon, he finds him striking too short at Greeks. His antique sword, rebellious to his arm, lies there it, where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal matched prize that Priam drives in rage strikes wide. But with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow, with flaming top stoops to his base, and with hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus's ear. For lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick. So, as a painted tyrant, Pius stood and like a neutral to his will in matter did nothing. But we, as but as ought we often see, against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stood still, stand still, the bold winds speechless in the orb below, as hush as death anon, the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So, after Pyrrhus's pause, aroused vengeance sets him newer work. And never did the Cyclops' hammer fall on Mars's armor forged for proof eternity, with less remorse than Pyrrhus's bleeding sword now falls on Priam. Out, out, thou strumpet fortune, all you gods in general sinner, take away her power, break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven as low as to the fiends. 
just too long. It shelves to the barbers with your beard. Prithee, say on. He's for a jig or a tail of Baudry, or he sleeps. Say on, come to Hecuba. But who, oh who, had seen the mobbled queen? The mobbled Bond- queen. That's good. Mobbled queen's good. Run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames. With thissome room, a clout about the head. Where late the diadem stood, and for a robe but her lank in all eternal loins, a blanket in the alarm of fear caught up, who this had seen with tongue and venom steeped against fortune's fate would treason have pronounced. But if the gods themselves did see her then, when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport, in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, the instant burst of clamor that she made, unless things mortal move them not all at all, would have much the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods. Look where he has not turned his color, and his tears in his eyes. Prithee, no more. Tis well. I'll have thee speak out the rest of this soon. Good, my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? Do you hear? Let them be well used, for they are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. After your death, you were better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. My lord, I will use them according to their desert. God's body guns, man, much better. Use every man after his desert, and who should escape a whipping? Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Come, sirs. Follow him, friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow. Dost thou hear me, old friend? Can you play the murder of Gonzago? I, my lord. We'll have tomorrow night. You could, for a need, study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines, which I would set down and insert in it, could you not? I, my lord. Very well. Follow that lord, and look you mock him not. My good friends, I'll leave you till tonight. You are welcome to Elsinore. Good, good, my lord. I so, God be with ye. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, uh, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing. For Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy metal rascal peak like John dreams, unpregnant of my cause and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie of the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this, huh? Swoons, I should take it for it cannot be, but I am pigeon livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter or ere this. I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful bloody body villain. Remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. Oh, vengeance! Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing like a very drab, a scullion. Fire upon it, foul, about my brain. 
I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tempt him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be a devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And on that, the curtain falls as we take our in first intermission for the day. Uh, get up, bio, get some water. The joy of doing these virtually means that there are no cues for the bathroom and the concession stand probably has your beverage of choice on hand for you. So take your time. We'll be back in about 15 minutes. Please, we'll be back again. See you soon.
Welcome everyone. We hope you are refreshed. We hope that the concession stand had your beverage of choice and that the, you remembered to tip your bartender. Um, always an important thing. Uh, but we are back and we are going to dive back into Act 3, Scene 1. Elsina, a room in the castle. Enter. King, Queen, Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, Guildenstorn, and all those other lords that apparently need to be with everybody else. They're hangers on. Very. Leaves and posers. Um, it's true, true. And can you, by no drift of circumstance, get from him why he puts on this confusion, grating so harshly all his days of quiet with turbulent and dangerous lunacy? He does confess he feels himself distracted, but from what cause he will by no means speak. Nor do we find him forward to be sounded, but the crafty madness keeps aloof, and we should bring him on to some confession of his true state. Did he receive you well? Most like a gentleman. But with much forcing of his disposition. Nigard of question, but of our demands, most free in his reply. Did you essay him to any pastime? I, madam, it so fell out that certain players were o'erwrought on the way. Of these we told him, and there did seem in him a kind of joy to hear it. They are here about the court, and as I think, they have already ordered this night to play before him. Tis most true, and he beseeched me to entreat your majesties to hear and see the matter. With all my heart, it doth much content me to hear him so inclined. Good gentlemen, give him a further edge and drive his purpose onto these delights. We shall, my lord. Oh, sweet Gertrude, leave us so. We have closely sent for Hamlet hither that he is, for by accident may hear affront Ophelia. Her father and myself, lawful lesbians, will so bestow ourselves that seeing unseen, we may of their encounter frankly judge and gather by him as he is behaved, if to be the affection of his love, or know that thus he suffers for. I shall obey you. And your, for your part, Ophelia, I, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wanted way again, to both your honors. Madam, I, I wish it may. Ophelia, walk you here. Gracious, so please you, we will bestow ourselves. Read on this book, that show of such an exercise may color your loneliness. We are off to blame in this. It's much proved that with devotion's visage and pious action we do sugar owe the devil himself. Oh, tis true. How smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience. The harlot's cheek, beautied with the plastering art, is not more ugly to the thing that helps it than is my deed to my most painted word? Oh, heavy burden. I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord. Enter Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. 
there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietest make with a bare bodkin. Who would these fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly to o'er with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now. The fair Ophelia. Nymph in thy orisons, be all my sins remembered. Good, my lord, how does your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. remembrances of yours that I have longed to re-deliver. I pray you, now receive them. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honored lord, you know right well you did, and with them words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich, their perfume lost, Take these again, for to the noble mind rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. Are you honest? My lord? Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? I, truly. For the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bod than the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I'm very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my beck than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do, crawling between earth and heaven? We are errant knaves all, believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? A at home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Farewell. I'll help him, you sweet heavens. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow. Thou shalt not escape calumny. Get thee to a nunnery. Go, farewell. Or, if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. To a nunnery, go, and quickly to farewell. Oh, heavenly powers, restore him. I have heard of your paintings, too, well enough. God hath given you one face, and you make yourselves another. You jig, you amble, and you lisp. You nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to. I'll know more on it. It hath made me mad. I say we will have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. To a nunnery. 
go. Oh, what a noble mind is your hearth home. The courtiers, scholars, soldiers, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of their fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down. And I of all ladies most eject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see the noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh that matched form and feature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. And uh, the king and Polonius. Love. His affections do not that way tend. Know what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul o'er which his melancholy sits on brood. And I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger, which for to prevent, I have in quick determination thus set it down. He shall with speed to England. For the demand of our neglected tribute, haply the seas and countries different with variable objects shall expel this something settled matter in his heart, whereon his brain still beating puts him thus from fashion of himself. What think you on it? It should do well, but yet do I believe the origin commencement of his grief sprung from neglected love. Oh no, Ophelia. You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. My lord, do as you please. But if you hold it fit after the play, let his queen mother all alone entreat him to show his grief. Let her be round with him. And I'll be placed so please you in the ear of all their confidence. If she find him not, to England send him. Or go find him where your wisdom best shall think. It shall be so. Madness in great ones must not unwatch it go. Act three, scene two. Elsinore, hall in the castle. Enter Hamlet and three of the players. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as leave the town crier spoke my lines. <laughs> Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but lose on gently, for in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. <laughs> it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to bury rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who, for the most part, are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noises. <laughs> I would have such a fellow whipped for or doing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. Pray you avoid it. I'll warn your honor. Be not too tame neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. To suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'ersep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as for the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. Now this overdone or come tardy off, though it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve, the censure of the which one must in your allowance or way a whole theater of others. Oh, there be players that I have seen play and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak it profanely, that neither having the accent of Christians nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man have so strutted and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. I hope we have reformed that indifferently with us, sir. No, reform it all together. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. For there be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too. 
though in the meantime some necessary question of the play be then to be considered that's villainous and shows the most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it go make you ready hmm how now my lord will the king hear this piece of work and the queen too and that presently bid the players make haste uh, will you two help to hasten them we will, we will my, my lord, lord. What ho, Horatio. Here, sweet lord, at your service. Horatio, thou art deemed as just a man as e'er my conversation coped with all. Oh, my dear lord. Oh, nay, do not think I flatter. For what advancement may I hope from thee that no revenue hast but thy good spirits to feed and clothe thee? Why should the poor be flattered? No, let the candied tongue lick absurd pomp and crook the pregnant hinges of the knee where thrift makes follow fawning. Dost thou hear? Since my dear soul was mistress of her choice, and could of men distinguish, her election hath sealed thee for herself, for thou hast been as one in suffering all that suffers nothing. A man that fortunes, buffets, and rewards has ta'en with equal thanks, and blessed are those whose blood and judgment are so well commingled that they are not a pipe for fortune's finger to sound what stop she please. Give me that man that is not passion slave, and I will wear him in my heart's core, I in my heart of heart, as I do thee. Something too much of this I... There is a play tonight before the king. One scene of it comes near the circumstance, which I have told thee of my father's death. I pray thee, when thou seest that act of foot, even with the very comment of thy soul, observe my uncle. If his occulted guilt do not itself unkennel in one speech, it is a damned ghost that we have seen, and my imaginations are as foul as Vulcan's stithy. Give him heedful note, and for I, mine eyes, will rivet to his face, and after we will both our judgments join in censure of his seeming. Well, my lord, if he steal aught false this play is playing, and scape detecting, I will play I will pay the theft. Sound a flourish. <laughs> Enter. The king, the queen, Thelonious, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and other lords attendant, with the guard carrying their torches. Because we need everybody on stage now. They are coming to the play. Uh, I must be idle. Get you a place. How fares our cousin Hamlet? Excellent, of faith. Of the chameleon's dish. I eat the air, promise, crammed. You cannot feed capons so. I have nothing with this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. No, nor mine now. My lord, you played once at the university, you say? And I did, uh, my lord, and was accounted a good actor. What did you enact? Uh, I didn't act Julius Caesar. I was killed in the capital. Brutus killed me. <laughs> it was a brute part of him to kill so capital a calf there. Be the players ready. Aye, my lord. Hey, stand upon your patience. Come hither, my dear Hamlet. Sit, sit by me. No, good mother. Here's metal more attractive. Oh, do you mock her? Lady, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean my head upon your lap. Aye, my lord. Did you think I meant country matters? I think nothing, my lord. That's a fair thought to lie between maids' legs. What is, my lord? Nothing. You are merry, my lord. Who I? I, my lord. Oh, God, your only jig maker. What should a man do but be merry? For look you how cheerfully my mother looks, and my father died within two hours. Nay, tis twice two months, my lord. So long! Nay, then, let the devil wear black, for I'll have a suit of sables. Oh, heavens, thy two months ago and not forgotten yet. Then there's hope a great man's memory may outlive his life half a year. But by your lady, he must build churches then, or else shall he suffer, not thinking on, with the hobby horse whose epitaph is, for oh, for oh, the hobby horse is forgot. <laughs> the dumb show enters, dumb being in this instance quiet. Enter a king and a queen, very lovingly. The queen embracing him, and he her. 
She kneels and makes a show of protestation unto him. He takes her up, declines his head upon her neck. He lays him down upon a bank of flowers. She, seeing him asleep, leaves him. Anon comes a fellow, takes off his crown, kisses it, pours poison in the sleeper's ear, and leaves him. The queen returns, finds the king dead, and makes passionate reaction. The poisoner, with some three or four mutes, comes again to seem to coddle her with her. The dead body is carried away. The poisoner woos the queen with gifts. She seems harsh and unwilling a while, but in the end accepts his love. Exit the players. What means this, my lord? Mary, this is Michin Naheko. It means mischief. Uh, be like this shows imports the argument of the play. We shall know by this fellow. The players cannot keep counsel. They'll tell all. Will he tell what this show meant? I or any show that you'll show him. Be not you ashamed to show. He'll not shame to tell you what it means. You are not. You are not. I'll mark the prey. Wait, hold on. Okay. Uh, I, believe that's I think prologue? that's the prologue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tanya, you want to take the prologue? Sure. For us and for our tragedy, here steeping your clemency, we beg your hearing patiently. This is a prologue or the posy of a ring. Uh, Tis brief, my lord. As woman's love. Um. <clears throat> Full thirty times hath Phoebus caught gone round, Neptune salt wash and Tellus orbit ground, and thirty dozen moons with borrowed sheen. About the world have times twelve thirties been. Since love our hearts and hymen did our hands unite commutual in most sacred bands. So many journeys may the sun and moon make us again court ere, uh, or ere love be done. But woe is me, you are so sick of late, so far from cheer and from your former state, that I distrust you. Yet, though I distrust, discomfort you, my lord, it nothing must, for woman's fear and love holds quantity in neither aught or in extremity. Now what my love is, proof hath made you know, and as my love is sized, my fear is so. Where love is great, the littlest doubts are fear, and where little fears grow great, great love grows there. Faith, I must leave thee, love, and shortly too, my operant powers their function leave to do. And thou shalt live in this fair world behind, honored, beloved, and happily one as kind. For husband shalt thou... Oh, confound the rest. Such love must needs be treason in my breast. When second husband let me be accursed, none wed the second but who killed the first. Poor mind, poor mind. Uh, the instances that second marriage move are base respects of thrift, but none of love. The second time I kill my husband dead when second husband kisses me in bed. I do believe you think what now you speak, but what we do determine oft we break. Purpose is but the slave to memory of violent birth, but poor validity, which now like fruit unripe sticks on the tree, but fall unshaken when they mellow be. Most necessary, tis what we forget, to pay ourselves what to ourselves is debt. What to ourselves in passion we propose, the passion ending doth the purpose lose. The violence of either grief or joy, their own enactures with themselves destroy. Where joy most rebels, grief doth most lament, grief joys, joy grieves on slender accident. This world is not for I, nor tis not strange that even our loves should with our fortunes change. For tis a question left us yet to prove whether love led fortune or us fortune love. The great man down you mark his favorite flies, 
the poor advanced makes friends of enemies. And hitherto doth love on fortune tend, for who not needs shall never lack a friend. And who in want a hollow friend doth try, directly seasons him his enemy. But orderly to end where I begun, our wills and fates do so contrary run. That our devices still all overthrown, our thoughts are ours, there ends none of our own. So think thou wilt no second husband wed, but die thy thoughts when thy first lord is dead. Nor earth to me give food, nor heaven light. Sport and repose lock me from day and night. To desperation turn my trust and hope, and anchor's cheer in prison be my scope. Each opposite that blanks the faith of face of joy, meet what I would have well, and it destroy. Both ear and ends pursue me lasting strife. If once a widow, ever I be a wife. If she should break it now. Tis deeply sworn, sweet, leave me here a while. My spirits grow dull, and fain I would beguile. The tedious day with sleep. Sleep rock thy brain, and never come mischance between us twain. Madam, how like you this play? The lady doth protest too much, methinks. Oh, but she'll keep her word. Have you heard the argument? Is there no offense in it? No, no. They do but jest. Poison in jest. No offense of the world. Uh, what do you call the play? The Mouse Trap. Mary Howe, uh, tropically, this play is the image of a murder done in Vienna. Mm. Gonzago is the Duke's name, his wife, Baptista. You shall see anon. Tis a knavish piece of work, but what of that? Your majesty and we that have free souls, it touches us not. Let the gall jade wince, our withers are unwrung. Oh, this is one Lucianus, nephew to the king. Uh, you are as good as a chorus, my lord. I could interpret between you and your love if I could see the puppet stallion. You are keen, my lord, you are keen. It would cost you a groaning to take off my edge. Still better and worse. So you must take your husband's. Begin, murderer. Pox, leave thy damnable faces and begin. Come, the croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Thoughts black, hands apt, drugs fit, and time agreeing. Confederate season, else no creature seeing. That mixture rank of midnight leaves collected. With Hecate's band thrice blasted, thrice infected. Thy natural magic and dire property on wholesome life usurped immediately. He poisons him in the garden for his estate. His name's Gonzago. Uh, the story is extant and written in very choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife. The, the king rises. What, freighted with false fire? How, how fares my lord? Get on with the play. Give me some light. Away. Lights, lights, lights. 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 Why Excellent. let the strucken... Excellent, everybody but Hamlet and Horatio. Why let the strucken deer go weep, the heart ungalled play. For some must watch while some must sleep. Thus runs the world away. Would not this, sir, in a forest of feathers, if the rest of my fortunes turn Turk with me, with two provincial roses on my raised shoes, get me a fellowship and a cry of players, sir? Half a share. A whole one eye. For thou dost know, O Damon dear, this realm dismantled was of Jove himself and now reigns here a very, very pageant. You might have rhymed. <laughs> Good, Horatio. I'll take the words... The ghost's word for a thousand pound. Didst perceive? Very well, my lord. Upon the talk of poisoning? I did very well note him. <laughs> Come some music. Come the recorders. For if the king like not the comedy, why then the like he likes it not purdy. Come some music. Enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Good, my lord. Vouchsafe me a word with you. Sir, a whole history. The king, sir. Aye, sir, what of him? Is in his retirement marvellous distempered. With drink, sir? No, my lord, rather with choler. 
your wisdom should show itself more richer to signify this to the doctor. For me to put him to his purgation would perhaps plunge him into far more collar. Good, my lord. Put your dis discourse into some frame and start not so wildly from my affair. I am tame, sir. Pronounce. The queen, your mother, in most great affliction of spirit, hath sent unto you. You are welcome. Nay, my good lord, this courtesy is not of the right breed. If it shall please you to make me a wholesome answer, I will do your mother's commandment. If not, your pardon and my return shall be the end of my business. Sir, I cannot. What, my lord? Make you a wholesome answer. My wit's diseased. But, sir, such answer as I can make, you shall command, or rather, as you say, my mother. Therefore, no more, but to the matter. My mother, you say. And then thus she says, your behavior has struck her into amazement and admiration. Oh, wonderful son that can so astonish a mother. But is there no sequel at the heels of this mother's admiration? In part. She desires to speak with you in her closet ere you go to bed. We shall obey. Were she ten times our mother? Have you any further trade with us? My lord? You once did love me. And do still by these kickers and stealers. Good, my lord. Uh, what is your cause of distemper? You do surely bar the door upon your own liberty. If you deny your griefs to your friend. Sir, I lack advancement. How can that be? When you have the voice of the king himself for your succession in Denmark. Aye, sir, but... While the grass grows, the proverb is something must see. Oh, the recorders. Let me see one. Uh, to withdraw with you. Why do you go about to recover the wind of me as if you would drive me into a toil? Oh, my lord, if my duty be too bold, my love is too unmannerly. I do not well understand that. Will you play upon this pipe? My lord, I cannot. I pray you. Believe me, I cannot. I do beseech you. I know no touch of it, my lord. It is as easy as lying. Govern these vantages with your fingers and thumbs. Give it breath with your mouth, and it will discourse most eloquent music. Uh, look you, these are the stops. But these cannot I command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. Why, look you now, how unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. And there is much music, excellent voice in this little organ, yet cannot you make it speak. Blood, do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me, you cannot play upon me. God bless you, sir. My lord, the queen would speak with you presently. Do you see yonder cloud that's almost in the shape of a camel? By the mass, uh, it is like a camel indeed. Methinks it is like a weasel. Yes, back like a weasel. Or like a whale. Very like a whale. Then I will come to my mother by and by. They fool me to the top of my bent. I will come by and by. I will say so. By and by is easily said. Leave me, friends. <sighs> Tis now the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now can I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on soft. Now to my mother. Oh, heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites. How in my words somever she be shent. To give them seals never, my soul consent. Act three, scene three, a room in the castle. Enter the king, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. I like him not. Nor stands it safe with us to let his madness range. Therefore, prepare you. I, your commission, will forthwith dispatch, and he to England shall along with you. 
the terms of our estate may not endure hazards so near us as doth hourly grow out of his lunacy. We will ourselves provide. Most holy and religious fear it is to keep those many, many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. A single and peculiar life is bound with all the strength and armor of the mind to keep itself from noise. But much more, that spirit upon whose we wheel depends and rests the lives of many. The cess of majesty dies not alone, but like a gulf doth draw what's near it with it. It is a massy wheel, fixed on the summit of the highest mount, to whose huge spokes ten thousand lesser things are mortised and adjoined, which when it falls, each small annexment petty consequence uh, attends the boisterous ruin. Never alone did the king sigh, but with a general groan. Arm you, I pray you, to this speedy voyage, for we will fetters put our upon this fear, which now goes to free footed. We will we haste, haste us. us. My lord. He's going to his mother's closet behind the arras. I'll convey myself to hear the process. Uh, I won't. She'll tax him home. And as you said, and wisely was it said, it is meet that some more audience than a mother, since nature makes them partial, shall hear the speech of vantage. Very well, my leaf. I'll call upon you ere you go to bed and tell you what I know. Thanks, my dear lord. My offense is rank. Smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it. A brother's murder. Pray can I not, though inclination be as sharp as will, my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. And like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin and both neglect. What of this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Where to serves mercy, but to confront the visage of offense? And what's in prayer but this twofold force to be foresawed ere we come to fall, or pardon being drowned? Then I'll look up, my fault is past. But oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder. That cannot be. Since I am still possessed of these effects for which I did the murder, my crown, mine own ambition, and my queen, may one be pardoned and retain the offense? In the corrupted currents of this world, offense's gilded hand may shove by justice, and oft to seen the wicked prize itself buys out the law, but tis not so above. There is no shuffling. The, there the action lies in his true nature. And we ourselves, compelled even to the teeth and forehead of our faults to give an evidence. What then? What rests? Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet, what can it when one cannot repent? Wretched state, bosom of black death, limed soul that struggling to be free art more engaged. Help, angels, make a say. Bow stubborn knees and heart with strings of steel, be soft as sinews of the newborn babe. All may be well. Now might I do it, Pat. Now he is praying, and now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven, and so am I revenged. That would be scant. A villain kills my father, and for that, I, his sole son, do the same villain send to heaven? Why, this is hire and salary, not revenge. 
He took my father grossly, full of bread, with all his crimes broad blown as flesh as may. And how he's aught it stands, who knows, save heaven? But in our circumstance and course of thought, tis heavy with him, and then I then revenged to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? No. Up, sword, and know thou a more horrid hent. When he is drunk asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at gaming, a swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it, then trip him that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell where to it goes. My mother stays. This physic but prolongs thy sickly days. My words fly up. My thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. Act three, scene four. The queen's closet. That means her room. Enter the queen and Polonius. He will come straight. What lay home to him. Tell him his pranks have been too broad to bear with, and that your grace has screened and stood between much heat and him. I'll silence me even here. Pray you be round with him. Mother! 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 I'll warrant you fear me not. Withdraw. I hear him coming. Now, mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? No, by the rude, not so. You are the queen, your husband's brother's wife, and would it were not so, you are my mother. Nay, then I'll set those to you that can speak. Come, come, and sit you down. You shall not budge. You go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What wilt thou do? Wilt thou not murder me? Help! Help, ho! What? Help! 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 How now? A rat! Dead! For a ducat! Dead! Oh, I am slain! Oh, me! What hast thou done? Nay, I know not. Is it the king? Oh, oh what a rash and bloody deed is this! A bloody deed? Almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. As kill a king? Ay, lady, it was my word. Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool, farewell. I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. Thou find'st to be too busy in some danger. Leave ringing of your hands. Peace, sit you down. And let me wring your heart, for so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff. If damned custom have not brazed it so, that it is proof and bulwark against sense. What have I done, that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love, and sets a blister there, makes marriage vows as false as dicer's oaths. <laughs> Such a deed as from the body of contraction plucks the very soul and sweet religion makes a rhapsody of words. Heaven's face doth glow. Yea, the solidity and compound mass with tristal visage as against the doom is thought sick at the act. Ah, me, what act that roars so loud and thunders in the index? Look here upon this picture and on this, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. See what a grace was seated on this brow. Hyperion's curls, the front of Jove himself, an eye like Mars to threaten and command. 
a station like the Herald Mercury, new lighted on a heaven kissing hill. A combination and a form indeed, for every god did seem to set his seal to give the world assurance of a man. This was your husband. Look you now what follows. Here is your husband, like a mildewed ear, blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten on this moor? Have you eyes? You cannot call it love, for at your age the heyday in the blood is tame. It's humble and waits upon the judgment. And what judgment would step from this to this sense sure you have? Else could you not have motion, but sure that sense is apoplexed, for madness would not err, nor sense to ecstasy was ne'er so thralled, but it reserved some quantity of choice to serve in such difference. What devil wast that thus hath cousined you at Hoodman blind? Eyes without feeling? Feeling without sight, ears without hands or eyes, smelling sands all, or but a sickly part of one true sense could not so mope. Oh, shame, where is thy blush? Rebellious hell, if thou canst mutant in a matron's bones, to flaming youth let virtue be as wax and melt in her own fire. Proclaim no shame when the compulsive ardor gives the change, since frost itself is apt to plead a fern and reason panders will. Oh, Hamlet, speak no more! Thou turnst mine eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their taint. Nay, but to live in the rank sweat of an inseamed bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. Oh, speak to me no more. These words like daggers into my ears. No more, sweet Hamlet. A murderer and a villain, a slave that is not 20th part the tide of your precedent, Lord, a vice of kings, a cut purse of the empire and the rule that from a shelf the precious diadem stole and put in his pocket. No more. A king of shreds and patches. Save me and overwhelm me with your wings, you heavenly guard. What would your gracious figure? Alas, he's mad. Do you not come your tardy son to chide? that lapsed in time and passion lets go by the important acting of your dread command? Oh, say. Do not forget. This visitation is but to whet thy almost blunted purpose. But look amazement on thy mother's sits. Step between her and her fighting soul. Conceit the weakest body's strongest works. Speak to her, Hamlet. How is it with you, lady? Alas, how is it with you, that you do bend your eye on, on vacancy, and with the incorrible air do hold discourse? For at your eyes your spirits widely, wildly peep, and as the sleeping soldiers in the alarm, your, your bedded hairs, like life in excrement, start up and stand on end. O oh, gentle sun, upon the heat and flame of thy distemper, sprinkle cool patience. Whereon do you look? On him, on him, look you how pale he glares. His form and cause conjoined preaching to stones would make them capable. Do not look upon me lest with this piteous action you convert my stern effects, then what I have to do will want true color, tears perchance for blood. To whom do you speak this? Do you see nothing there? Nothing at all, yet all that is I see. Nor did you nothing here? No, nothing but ourselves. Why, look you there. Look how it steals away. My father, in his habit as he lived, look where he goes even now, out at the portal. 
this is the very coinage of your brain. This bodiless creation ecstasy is very cunning in. Ecstasy? My pulse is yours doth temperately keep time and makes us healthful music. It is not madness that I have uttered. Bring me to the test and I the matter will reword which madness would gamble from mother for love of grace. Lay not that flattering unction to your soul that not your trespass but my madness speaks. It will but skin and fill the ulcerous place whilst rank corruption mining all within infects unseen. Confess yourself to heaven, repent what's past, avoid what is to come and do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them ranker. Forgive me this my virtue for in the fatness of these pursy times virtue itself a vice must pardon beg. Yea, curb and woo for leave to do him good. Oh, Hamlet. Thou hast cleft my heart in twain. Throw away the worser part of it and live the purer with the other half. Good night, but go not to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. That monster of custom who all sense doth eat of habits evil is angel yet in this, that to the use of actions fair and good, he likewise gives a frock or livery that aptly is put on, refrain tonight, and that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence, the next more easy, for use almost can change the stamp of nature and either master the devil or throw him out with wondrous potency once more, good night. And when you are desirous to be blessed, I'll blessing beg of you. For the same Lord, I do repent but heaven hath pleased it so to punish me with this and this with me, that I must be their scourge and minister. I will bestow him and will answer well the death I gave him. So again, good night. I must be cruel only to be kind. Thus bad begins and worse remains behind. One word more, good lady. What shall I do? Not this by no means that I bid you do. Let the bloat king tempt you again to bed, pinch wanton on your cheek, call you his mouth, and let him for a pair of reachy kisses, or paddling in your neck with his damned fingers, make you to ravel all this matter out, that I essentially am not in madness, but mad in craft. Twere good you let him know, for who that's but a queen, fair, sober, wise, would from a paddock, from a bat, a, a gib, such dear concerning tide, who would do so? No, in despite of sense and secrecy, unpeg the basket on the house's top. Let the birds fly, and like the famous ape, to try conclusions in a basket creep and break your own neck down. Be thou assured, if, if the words be made of breath and breath of life, I... I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. I must to England, you know that. Alack, I'd forgot. Tis so concluded on. There is letters sealed, and my two schoolfellows, whom I will trust as I will adders fanged, they bear the mandate. They must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. Let it work. For it is the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard and shall go hard. But I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. <laughs> it is most sweet when in one line two crafts directly meet. This man shall set me packing. I'll lug the guts into the neighbor room. Mother, good night. Indeed, this counselor is now most still, most secret, and most grave, who was in life a foolish, prating knave. Come, sir, to draw toward an end with you. Good night, mother. Exit the queen, and then exit Hamlet, tugging on Polonius, because, you know, body. And with that, we are going to take our second intermission for the day as we end Act 3 of Hamlet. 
we hope we're going to be a slightly shorter intermission, about 10 minutes, get some refreshments, get up, walk around, do some squats, move around, feel good, and we will be back in about 10 minutes for the conclusion of the tragedy of Hamlet.
<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our conclusion of the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, as written by William Shakespeare. So, we hope you're all refreshed. We hope you're all ready to dive back into the end as we begin with Act 4, Scene 1. Elsinore, a room in the castle. Enter the king and queen with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. There's Mata in these sighs, these profound heaves. They must translate. Tis fit we understand them. Where is your son? Bestow this place on us a little while. Ah, oh, mine own lord, what, what have I seen tonight? What, Gertrude? How does Hamlet? Mad as the sea and wind when both contend with which is mightier. In, in his lawless fit, behind the heiress, hearing something stir, whips out his rapier, cries a rat, a rat, and in this brainish apprehension, kills the unseen good old man. Oh, heavy deed! It had been so with us. Had we been there, his liberty is full of threats to all, to yourself, to us, to everyone. Alas, how shall this bloody deed be answered? It will be laid to us, whose providence should have kept short, restrained, and out of haunt this young man. But so much was our love. We would not understand what was most fit, but like the owner of a foul disease, to keep it from divulging, let it feed even on the pit of life. Where is he gone? To draw apart the body he hath killed, or whom is his very madness, like, like some ore among a mineral metal's base, shows itself pure. He weeps for what is done. Oh, Gertrude, come away. The sun no sooner shall the mountains touch, but we will ship from hence, and this vile deed we must with all our majesty and skill, both countenance and excuse. Ho, Guildenstern! Friends, both. Go join you with some further aid. Hamlet in madness hath Polonius slain. And from his mother's closet hath he dragged him. Go seek him out. Speak fair. And bring the body into the chapel. I pray you hasten this. Come, Gertrude. We call up our wisest friends and let them know both what we mean to do, and what's untimely done. Whose whisper, or the world's diameter, as level as the cannon to his blank, transports his poisoned shot, may miss our name and hit the woundless air? Oh, come away. My soul is full of discord and dismay. Scene two, Elsinore, a passage in the castle. Enter Hamlet. Safely stowed. Hamlet? Hamlet? Lord Hamlet. Lord Hamlet. What's soft, what noise? Who calls on Hamlet? Oh, here they come. What have you done, my lord, with the dead body? Compounded it with dust where to tis kin. Tell us where it is, that we may take it thence and bear it to the chapel. Do not believe it. Believe what? That I can keep your counsel and not mine own. Besides, to be demanded of a sponge, what replication should be made by the son of a king? Take you me for a sponge, my lord. I, sir, that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities. But such officers do the king best service in the end. He keeps them like an ape in the corner of his jaw, first mouth to be last swallowed. When he needs what you have gleaned, it is but squeezing you and sponge, you shall be dry again. I understand you not, my lord. I am glad of it. A knavish speech sleeps in a foolish ear. My lord, 
You must tell me, you must tell us where the body is and go forth with us to the king. The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. A thing, my lord? Of nothing. Bring me to him. Hide fox and all after. Act four, scene three, Elsinore, a room in the castle. Enter the king. I have sent to seek him and to find the body. How dangerous is it that this man goes loose? Yet must not we put the strong law on him, his loved of the distracted multitude, who like not in their judgment but their eyes, and were tis so, the offender's scourge is weighed. But never the offense. To bear all smooth and even, this sudden sending him away must seem deliberate pause. Diseases, desperate, grown by desperate appliance, are relieved, or not at all. How now? Oh, what hath befallen? Where the dead body is bestowed, my lord, we cannot get from him. But where is he? Without my lord, guarded to know your pleasure. Bring him before us. Oh, Guildenstern, bring in my lord. Now, Hamlet, where's Polonius? At supper. At supper? Where? Not where he eats, but where he is eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are e'en at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Your fat king and your lean beggar is but variable service. Two dishes, but to one table. That's the end. Alas, alas! A man may fish with the worm that hath eat of a king, and eat of the fish that hath fed of that worm. What dost thou mean by this? Nothing but to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar. Where is Polonius? In heaven. Send thither to see. If your messenger find him not there, seek him in the other place yourself. But indeed, if you find him not within this month, you shall know him as you go up the stair into the lobby. Go seek him there. Oh, he will stay till you come. Hamlet, this deed for thine especial safety, which we do tender as we daily grieve, for that which thou hast done, must send thee hence with fiery quickness. Therefore prepare thyself, the bark is ready, and the wind at help. The associates tend, and everything is bent for England. For England? I Hamlet. Good. So is it, if thou knewst our purposes. I see a cherub that sees them. But come, for England, farewell, dear mother. My loving father, Hamlet. My mother. Father and mother is man and wife. Man and wife is one flesh, and so my mother. Come, for England. Follow him at foot. Tempt him with speed aboard. Delay it not. I'll have him hence tonight away. For everything is sealed and done. That else leans on the affair. Pray you make haste. And England. If my love thou holdst at aught, as my great power thereof may give thee sense. Since yet, thy cicatrice look raw and red after the Danish sword. And thy free are, pays homage to us. Thou mayst not coldly set our sovereign process, which imports at full by letters congruing to that effect, the present death of Hamlet. Do it, England. For like the hectic in my blood, he rages. And thou must cure me. Till I know tis done, or my haps, my joys are never begun. 
Act four, scene four. Enter Fortinbras with his army over the stage. Go, Captain. From me, greet the Danish king. Tell him that by his light, since Fortinbras craves the conveyance of a promised march over his kingdom, you know the rendezvous. If that his majesty would aught with us, we shall express our duty in his eye and let him know so. I'll do it, my lord. Go softly on. Good sir, whose powers are these? Uh, they are of Norway, sir. How purpose, sir, I pray you? Against some part of Poland. Who commands them, sir? The nephew of old Norway, Fortinbras. Goes it against the main of Poland, sir, or for some frontier? Truly to speak, and with no addition, we go to gain a little patch of ground that hath in it no profit but the name to pay five ducats. Five. I would not farm it, nor will it yield to Norway or the Pole at rancor rate, should it be sold in fee. Why, then, the Polak never will defend it. Yes, it is already garrisoned. Two thousand souls and twenty thousand ducats will not debate the question of this straw. This is the imposthume of much wealth and peace that inward breaks and shows no cause without why the man dies. I humbly thank you, sir. God be with you, sir. Will, will it please you go, my lord? I'll be with you straight. Go a little before. How all occasion do of inform against me and spur my dull revenge. What is a man if his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed a beast no more? Sure, he that made us with such large discourse, looking before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. Now, whether it be bestial oblivion or some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event, a thought which quartered hath but one part wisdom and ever three parts coward. I, I do not know why yet I live to say this thing's to do. Did I have cause and will and strength and means to do it? Examples gross as earth exhort me. Witness this army of such mass and charge, led by a delicate and tender prince, whose spirit with divine ambition puffed makes mouths at the invisible event, exposing what is mortal and unsure to all that fortune, death, and danger dare, even for an eggshell. Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honor's at the stake. How stand I then that have a father killed, a mother stained, excitements of my reason and my blood, and let all sleep, while to my shame I see the imminent death of twenty thousand men that for a fantasy and trick of fame go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot whereon the numbers cannot try the cause, which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain. From this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. Act four, scene five, Elsinar, a room in the castle. Enter Horatio, the queen, and a gentleman of some worth, I guess. Rando gentleman. I will not speak with her. She is unfortunate, indeed distract. Her mood will needs be pitied. What would she have? She speaks much of her father, says she hears there's tricks in the world and hems and beats her heart. Spurns envious at straws, speaks things in doubt that carry but half sense. Her speech is nothing, yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection. They aim at it and botch the words up to fit to their own thoughts, which, as her winks and nods and gestures yield them, indeed would make one think there might be thought of nothing sure, but much unhappily. For good she were spoken with, for she made shrewd, dangerous conjectures in ill-breeding minds. Let her come in. 
to my sick soul as sin's true nature is, each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. So full of artless jealousy is guilt, it spills itself in fearing to be spilt. Enter Ophelia, distracted. Where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? How now, Ophelia? How should I your true love know from another one? By his cockle bat and staff and his sandal shoe. Alas, sweet lady, what, what imports this song? Say you, nay, pray, you mark. He's dead and gone, lady, he's dead and gone. At his head a grass green turf, at his heels a stone. Ho ho. Nay, nay, but Ophelia, but... How should pray you mark white his shroud as mountain snow? Alas, look here, my lord. Larded with sweet, all with sweet flowers which bewept to the grave did not go with true love's showers. How do you do? Pretty lady. Well, God build you. They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Lord, we know not what we are, but know not what we may be. God be at your table. And seat upon her father. Pray, let's have no more words of this. When they ask you what it might mean, say you this. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day. All in the morning betide, and I, a maid at your window, will be your valentine. And then up he rose and donned his clothes and ducked to the chamber door, let in the maid, let out, let out a maid, and never departed more. Pretty Ophelia. Indeed, La, without an oath I'll make an end of it. By kiss and by sweet charity, St. Charity, a lack and five for shame. The young men will do it if they become to it. By cock they are to blame. Quoth she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. The answer so and would I had done. But yonder, son, thou hadst not come to my bed. How long has she been thus? I hope all will be well. We must be patient. But I cannot choose but weep to think they would lay him in the cold ground. My brother shall know of it. And so I thank you for your good counsel. Come, my coach. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Follow her close. Give her good watch, I pray you. This is the poison of deep grief. It springs all from her father's death. Oh, Gertrude, Gertrude. When sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. First, her father slain. Next, your son gone and he most violent author of his own just removed. The people muddied, thick, and, and unwholesome in their thoughts and whispers for good Polonius's death. And we have done but greenly in Hugga to inter him. Poor Ophelia divided from herself and her fair judgment, without the which we are pictures of mere beasts. Last, and as much containing as all of these, her brother is in secret come from France. Feeds on his wonder, feeds, keeps himself in clouds and wants not buzzers to infect his ear with pestilent speeches of his father's death, wherein necessity of matter beggared will nothing stick to our person to arraign in ear and ear. Gertrude, this like a, to a murdering piece. 
in many places give me superfluous death and noise within. Alack, what noise is this? Where are my switches? Let them guard the door. What is the matter? Save yourself, my lord. The ocean, overpeering of his list, eats not the flask with more impetuous haste than young Laertes, in a riotous head, or bears your offices. The rabble call him lord, and as the world were now but to begin, antiquity forgot, custom not known, the ratifiers and props of every word. Their cry chose we, Laertes shall be king. Caps, hands, and tongues applauded to the clouds. Laertes shall be king. Laertes shall be king. How cheerfully on the false trail they cry. Oh, this is counter, you false Danish dogs. The doors are broke. Where's the king? Sirs, stage you all without. No, oh, let's come, come in. in. I pray you give me leave. We will, we will. We will. I thank you. Keep the door. Oh, thou vile king, give me my father. <clears throat> Calm me, good Laertes. That drop of blood that calm proclaims me bastard. Christ cuckolds my father, brands the harlot, even here between the chaste and unsmutched brows of my true mother. What is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? Let him go, Gertrude. Do not fear our person. There's such divinity doth hedge a king. The treason can but peep to what it would. Acts little of his will. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed? Let him go, Gertrude. Speak, man. Where is my father? Dead. But not by him. Let him demand his fill. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. To hell allegiance, vows to the blackest devil, conscience and grace, to the profoundest pit. I dare damnation. To this point I stand, that both the world I give to negligence, let come what comes. Only I'll be revenged most thoroughly for my father. Who shall stay you? My will, not all the world. And for my means, I'll husband them so well they shall go far with little. Good Laertes, if you desire to know the certainty of your dear father's death, is it writ in your revenge that sweepstake you will draw both friend and foe, winner and loser? None but his enemies. Will you know them then? To his good friends thus wide, I'll open my arms and like the kind life-rendering pelican, repass them with my blood. Why? Now you speak like a good child and a true gentleman that I am guiltless of your father's death and am most sensibly in grief for it. It shall as level to your judgment pierce as day does to your eye. Let her come in. How now? What noise is that? Oh. O oh, heat dryeth my brains, tears seven times salt, burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye. By heaven, thy madness shall be paid by weight till our scale turn the beam. Oh, oh rose of May, dear maid, kind sister, sweet Ophelia. Oh heavens, is possible a young maid's wits should be as mortal as an old man's life? Nature is fine in love and where it is fine, it sends some precious instance of itself after the thing it loves. He bore him barefaced on the briar. Hey, nanny, nanny, hey, nanny. And in his grave rained many a tear. Fare you well, my dove. Hadst thou thy wits and didst persuade revenge, it could not move me thus. You must sing. A down, a down, you call him a down. Oh, how the wheel becomes it. It is a false steward that stole his master's daughter. This nothing's more than matter. There's Rosemary. That's for remembrance. Pray you, love, remember. And there are pansies. That's for thoughts. A document in madness. 
Thoughts and remembrances fitted. There's fennel for you, and columbines. There's rue for you, and here's some for me. We may call it an herb of grace of Sundays. Oh, you must wear your rue with a difference. There's a daisy. I would give you some violets, but they withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. For Bonnie, sweet Robin is all my joy. Thought and affliction, passion, hell itself. She turns to favor and to prettiness. And will he not come again? Will he not come again? No. No, he's dead. Gone to thy deathbed. He'll never come again. His beard it was as white as snow, all flaxen was his poll. He is gone. He is gone. And we cast away, moan, God's a mercy on his soul. And of all crud Christian souls, I pray, God, God be with you. Do you, do you see this? Oh, God. Laertes, I must commune with your grief, or you deny me right. Go but apart. Make choice of whom your wisest friends you will, and they shall hear and judge twixt you and me. If by direct or by collateral hand they find us touched, we will our kingdom give, our crown, our life, and all that we call ours to you in satisfaction. But if not, be you content to lend your patience to us, and we shall jointly labor with your soul to give it due content. Let this be so. His means of death, his obscure funeral, no trophy, sword, nor hatchment or his bones, no noble rite nor formal ostentation, cry to be heard as twere from heaven to earth that I must call it in question. So you shall. And where the offense is let, the great axe fall. I, I, I pray you, go with me. Act four, scene six. Elsinore, another room in the castle. Enter Horatio with a servant. What are they that they would speak with me? Seafaring men, sir, they say they have letters for you. Let them come in. I do not know from what part of the world I should be greeted, if not from Lord Hamlet. God bless you, sir. Let him bless thee, too. I shall, sir. I please him. There's a letter for you, sir. Comes from the ambassador of was bound for England. If your name be Horatio, as I am let to know it is. Horatio, when thou shalt have overlooked this, give these fellows some means to the king. They have letters for him, ere we were two days old at sea. A pirate of the very warlike appointment gave us chase. Finding ourselves too slow of sail, we put on a compelled valor, and in the grapple I boarded them. On the instant they got clear of our ship, so I alone became their prisoner. They have dealt with me like thieves of mercy, but they knew what they did. I am to do a good turn for them. Let the king have the letters I have sent, and repair thou to me with as much speed as thou would fly wouldst fly death. I have words to speak in thine ear that will make me dumb, make thee dumb. Yet they are much too light for the bore of the matter. These good fellows will bring thee where I am, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern hold their course for England. Of them I have much to tell thee. Farewell. He that kn he that thou knowest thine, Hamlet. Come, I will give you way for the for these your letters and do it the speedier that you may direct me, to him from whom you brought them. Act four, scene seven, Elsinore, another room in the castle. Enter the king and the Artes. How must your conscience my acquittance seal? And you must put me in your heart for friend. Sith, you have heard and with a knowing ear, that he which hath your noble father slain pursued my life. 
It well appears. But tell me why you proceeded not against these feats so crimeful and so capital in nature as by your safety wisdom all things else you mainly were stirred up. Oh, for two special reasons, which may to you perhaps seem much unsinewed, but yet to me they are strong. The queen, his mother, lives almost by his looks. And for myself, my virtue or my plague, be it either which, she's so conjunctive to my life and soul that as the star moves, not but in his sphere, I could not but buy her. The other motive, why to public count I might not go, is the great love the general gender bear him, who, dipping all his faults in their affection, would like the spring that turneth wood to stone, convent his gives to graces, so that my arrows, too slightly timbered for so loud a wind, would have reverted to my bow again, and not where I had aimed them. And so have I a noble father lost, the sister driven into desperate terms, whose worth, if praises may go back again, stood challenger on mount of all the age for her perfections. But my revenge will come. Break not your sleeps for that. You must not think that we are made of stuff so flat and dull that we can let our beard be shook with danger. And think it past time. You shortly shall hear more. I loved your father. And we love ourself, and that, I hope, will teach you to imagine... How now? What news? Let us, my lord, from Hamlet. This to your majesty, this to the queen. From Hamlet? Who brought them? Sailors, my lord, they say. I saw them not. They are given to me by Claudio. He received them of him that brought them. Laertes, you shall hear them. Leave us. High and mighty, you shall know I am set naked on your kingdom. Tomorrow shall I beg leave to see your kingly eyes when I shall, first asking your pardon therein to recount the occasion of my sudden and more strange return. Hamlet. What should this mean? Are all the rest come back? Or is it some abuse and no such thing? Know you the hand? Tis Hamlet's character, naked. And in a postscript here, he says, alone? Can, can you advise me? I'm lost in it, my lord, but, but let him come. It warms the very singus in my heart that I shall live and tell him to his teeth. Thou diest, I diedest thou. If it be so, Laertes, as how should it be so? How otherwise? Will you be ruled by me? I, my lord. So you will not o'er rule me to a peace. To thine own peace. If he be now returned, as checking at his voyage, and that he means no more to undertake it, I will work him to exploit now right in my device. Under the which he shall not choose but fall. And for his death no wind shall breathe, but even his mother shall uncharge the practice and call it accident. My lord, I will be ruled, though rather if you could devise it so that I might be the organ. It falls right. You have been talked of since your travel much. And that in Hamlet's hearing, for quality wherein they say you shine, your sum of parts did not together pluck such envy from him as did that one. And that, in my regard, of the unworthiest siege. What part is that, my lord? A very ribbon in the camp of youth. Yet needful too, for, no, for youth no less becomes the light and careless livery that it wears, then settled age has his sables and his weeds, importing health and graveness. Two months since, here was a gentleman of Normandy. I have seen myself and served against the French, and they, call, they can well on horseback, but this gallant had witchcraft in it. He grew unto his seat, and to such wondrous doing brought his horse as 
had he been in corpse with demi-natured with the brave beast. So far he topped my thought that I, in forgery of shapes and tricks, come short of what he did. A, a Norman was it? A Norman. Upon my life. Uh, Lavound? The very same. I, I know him well. He's the brooch indeed and Jim of all the nation. He made confession of you and gave you such a masterly rapport for art and exercise in your defense and for your rapier most especially that he cried out, "'Twould be a sight indeed if one could match you. The scribers of their nation, he swore, had neither motion, God nor I. If you opposed them, sir, this report of his did Hamlet so envenom with his envy that he could nothing do but wish and beg your sudden coming o'er to play with you. Now, out of this... What out of this, my lord? Laertes, was your father dear to you? Or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Why ask you this? Now, that I think you did not love your father, but that I know love is begun by time, and that I see. And passages of proof, time qualifies the spark and fire of it. There lives within the very flame of love a kind of wick or snuff that will abate it. And nothing is like goodness still, for goodness, growing to a pleurisy, dies in his own too much. That we would do. We should do when we would, for this wood changes and hath abatements and delays as many as there are tongues, our hands, our accidents. And then this should is like a spendthrift sigh that hurts by easing, but to the quick, oh, the ulcer. Hamlet comes back. What would you undertake to show yourself, your father's son indeed, more than words? To cut his throat in the church. No place indeed should murder sanctuarize. Revenge should have no bounds. But, good Laertes, will you do this? Keep close within your chamber. Hamlet returns shall know you are here, come home. We'll put on those shall praise your excellence and set a double varnish on the fame the Frenchman gave you. Bring you in fine together and wager on your heads. He, being remiss, most generous and free from all contriving, will not pursue the foils, so that with ease or with a little shuffling, you may choose a sword unabated and in a passive practice requite him for your father. I will do it. And for that purpose, I'll anoint my sword. I bought an unction of a mountebank so mortal that, but dip a knife in it, where it draws blood, no cataplasm so rare, collected from all simples that have virtue under the moon, can save a thing from death that is but scratched withal. I'll touch my point with this contagion that, if I gall him slightly, it may be death. Hmm. Let's... Further think of this, weigh what convenience both of time and means may fit us to our shape. If this should fall, and that our uh, drift look through our bad performance, twere better not to say it. Therefore, this project should have a back or second that might hold if this did blast in proof. Soft. Let me see. We'll make a solemn wager on your cunnings. I have. When in your motion you are hot and dry, as make your bouts more violent to that end and that he calls for drink, I'll have prepared him a chalice for the nonce, whereupon but sipping, if he by chance escape your venomed stomach. Our purpose may hold there. But stay. What noise? How now, sweet queen? One woe doth tread upon another's heel, so, so fast they follow. Your sister's drowned, Laertes. Drowned? 
Oh, where? There is a willow grows a slant of brook that shows his hoar leaves in the grassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she come of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples. The liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs her coronet weeds clamoring to hang, an envious silver sliver broke when down her weedy trophies and herself fell into the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide and mermaid and mermaid like a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress or like a creature native and endued unto that element. But long it could not be that till her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Uh, alas, then she is drowned? Drowned. Too much of water hast thou, poor Ophelia, and therefore I forbid my tears, but yet it is our trick. Nature her custom holds. Let shame say what it will. When these are gone, the woman will be out. Adieu, my lord. I have a speech of fire that fain would blaze, but this folly doubts it. Let's follow. Gertrude, how much I had to do to calm his rage, I now fear I this will give it start again. Therefore, let's follow. Act five, scene one. Elsinore, a churchyard. Enter two clowns with spades and pickaxes. Is she to be buried in Christian burial when she literally seeks her own salvation? Uh, I tell thee she is, therefore make her grave straight, the crown of her stay on her, and finds it Christian burial. How can that be? Unless she drowned herself in her own defense. Why it is found. It must be so window. It cannot be else. For, for here lies the point. If I draw myself wittingly, it argues an act. And an act hath three branches. It is to act, to do, to perform. Argyle, she drowned herself willingly. Nay, but hear yourself, good Del Delva. Give me leave. Here lies the water. Good. Here stands the man. Good. If the man go to this water and drown himself, it is willy-nilly he goes mark you that but if the water comes to him and drown him not himself argal he that is not guilty of his own death shortens not his own life but is this the law i marry is crown's quest law will you have the truth ain't it if this had not been a gentleman she should not have been buried out of christian burial well there thou sayest more the pity that great folk should have the countenance in this world to drown or hang themselves more than they're even Christian. Come, my spade. There is no ancient gentleman but gardeners, ditchers, and grave makers. They hold up Am's profession. Where's the gentleman? I was the first that ever bore arms. Why? Had he, why? He had he had none. Uh, what? Are a heathen? How else do I understand the scripture? Scripture says Adam digged. Could he dig without arms? Put another question to thee. If thou answer me not to the purpose, confess thyself. Go to. What is he that builds stronger than either the mason, the shipwright, or the carpenter? The gallows maker, for that frame outlives a thousand tenants. <laughs> I like that wit well, in good faith. Gallows does well. But how does it well? Does well does do ill. Now, thou dost ill to say the gallows is built stronger than the church. Argyle, the gallows may do well to thee. So again, come. 
Who builds stronger than the mason, a shipwright, or a carpenter? I tell me that and not a yoke. No, no, I can tell. Toots? Mass, I cannot tell. Cudgel thy brains no more of it, for your dull ass will not mend this place with beating. When you are asked this question next, say, Gravemaker, the houses he makes last till doomsday. <laughs> Go get thee on. Fetch me a stoop of liquor. <sighs> In youth, when I did love, did love, me thought it was very sweet. To contract all the time before a bow hove over me thought there are nothing in the meat. Has this fellow no feeling of his business that he sings at grave making? Custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. It is e'en so. The hand of little employment hath the daintier sense. But age with his stealing steps hath called me in his clutch, and hath he shipped me into the land as if it had not been such. That skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. How the name jowls it to the ground as if twere Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. This might be the pate of a politician, which this ass now o'erreaches, one that would circumvent God, might it not? It might, my lord. Or of a courtier, which could say, Good morrow, sweet lord, how dost thou, good lord? This might be my lord such a one that praised my lord such a one's horse when he meant to beg it, might it not? Hi, my lord. Why, even so. And now my lady worms, chapless and knocked about the mazard with a sexton's spade. Here's fine revolution, and we had the trick to see it. But these bones cost no more the breeding but to play at lockets with them. Mine ache to think on it. Hmm, a pickaxe in a spade, a spade. For when the shouting sheet of peat of clay be made, for such a guest is me. There's another. Why may not that be the skull of a lawyer? Where be his quidditz now, his quillets, his cases, his tenures, and his tricks? Why does he suffer this rude knave now to knock him about the sconce with a dirty shovel and will not tell him of his action of battery? <laughs> this fellow might be in his time a great buyer of land with his statutes, his recognances, his fines, his double vouchers, his recoveries. Is this the fine of his fines? and the recovery of his recoveries to have his fine pate full of fine dirt. Will his vouchers vouch him no more of his purchases and double ones too than the length and breadth of a pair of indentures? The very conveyances of his land will scarcely lie in this box and must the inheritor himself have no more, huh? Not a jot no more, my lord. Is that parchment made of sheepskins? Ay, my lord, and of calfskins too. They are sheep and calves which seek out assurance in that. I will speak to this fellow. Whose graves this, Sirrah? Mine, sir. Open a clay for to be made for such a gist as me. I think it be thine indeed, for thou liest, didn't. You lied out on, sir, and therefore tis not yours. For my part, I do not lie it, yet it is mine. Thou dost lie in, to be in, to say it is thine. Tis for the dead, not for the quick. Therefore thou liest. Tis a quick lie, sir. It will again from me to you. What man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. What woman, then? For none, neither. Who is to be buried in it? One that was a woman, sir, but rest her soul, she's dead. How absolute the knave is. We must speak by the card, or equivocation will undo us. By the Lord, Horatio, this three years I have taken note of it, the age has grown so picked that the toe of the peasant comes so near the heel of the courtier, he galls his jibe. How long has thou been a grave maker? Of all the days of the year, I came to it that day that our last King Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. How long is that since? Uh, can it? You tell that? Every fool could tell that. It was the very day that young Hamlet was born. He there is mad and sent into England. I marry. Why was he sent into England? Why? Because he was mad. Shall we cover his wits there, or if do not, tis no great matter there. Why? So not he seen in him there. There are the men as mad as he. How came he mad? Very strangely, they say. How strangely? Faith. Even with losing his wits. Upon what ground? Why, here in Denmark. I've been sectioned here, man, and boy, 30 years. 
How long will a man lie at the earth ere he rot? Faith, if it be not rotten before he die, as we have many pocky corpses nowadays that will scarce hold the laying in, I'll last you some eight year, nine year. The title will last you a nine year. Why he more than another? Why, sir, his hides is so tanned with his trade that all will keep water a great while, and your water is a sore decay in your wholesome dead body. Eh, here's a skull now. Skull of wine, you the earth, three and twenty years. Whose was it? A horse on mad valor to us. Uh, Who do you think he was? Nay, I know not. The pestilence on him for a mad rogue. <laughs> Pulled a flagon of Rhenish on my head once. This same skull, sir, was Yorick's skull, King's Jester. This? Enoch. Uh, let me see. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grinning, <laughs> quite chapfallen. Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick to this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Pretty Horatio, tell me one thing. What's that, my lord? Does thou think Alexander looked at this fashion of the earth? E'en so. And smelt so? <laughs> E'en so, my lord. To what base uses we may return, Horatio? Why, may not imagination trace the nobleness of Alexander till he find it stopping a bunghole? Twer, can, twer to consider too curiously to consider so. No, faith, not a jot, but to follow him thither with modesty enough and likelihood to lead it, as thus, Alexander died, Alexander was buried, Alexander returneth into dust, the dust is earth, of earth we make loam, and why of that loam, whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? Imperius Caesar, dead and turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. Oh, that the earth which kept the world in awe should patch a wall to expel the winter's flaw. But soft, but soft aside, here comes the king. Uh, the, the queen, the courtiers, who is this they follow? And with such maimed rights, this doth betoken the course they follow did with desperate hand fordo its own life. Twas of some estate. Couch me a while and mark. What ceremony else? That is Laertes, a very noble youth, Mark. What ceremony else? Her obsequies have been as far and large as we have warranty. Her death was doubtful. But that great command always sways the older that she should in ground unsanctified be lodged till the last trumpet. Charitable prayers, shards, flints, and pebbles should be thrown on her, yet here she is allowed her virgin rites, her maiden strewments, and bringing home a bear, bell and burial. Must there be no more done? No more done. We should profane the service of the dead to sing a requiem, and such rest to her as peace part of souls. Lay her on the earth, and from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violet spring. I tell thee, churlish priest, a ministering angel shall my sister be when thou liest howling. Like the fair Ophelia. Sweet to the sweet, farewell. I hope thou should have been my Hamlet's wife. I thought thy bride bed to have decked sweet maid and not have strewed thy grave. Oh, terrible woe. Fall ten times tremble on that cursed head whose wicked deed thy most ingenious sense deprived thee of. Hold off the earth a while till I have caught her once more in my arms. And now I leap into the grave, just like uh, in the first episode of Twin Peaks, or fourth or fifth. 
Now pile your dust upon the quick and dead till of this flat of mountain you have made. Tore top old Pelion or the skyish head of blue Olympus. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis? Whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wonder-wounded hearts? This is I, Hamlet the Dane. The devil take your soul! Thou prayest not well. I pray thee take thy fingers from my throat. For though I am not splendative and rash, yet have I in me something dangerous, which let thy wisdom fear. Hold off thy hand. Fuck them asunder. Hamlet, Hamlet. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Good, my lord, be quiet. I will fight with him upon this theme until my eyelids will no longer wag. Oh, my son, what theme? I loved Ophelia. 40,000 brothers could not, with all their quantity of love, make up my sum. What wilt thou do for her? Oh, he is mad, Laertes. For the love of God, forbear him. His wounds, show me what thou do. Would weep? Would fight? Would fast? Would tear thyself? Would drink up Essil? Eat a crocodile? I'll do it. Dost thou come here to whine, to outface me with leaping in her grave? Be buried quick with her, and so will I. And if thou prate of mountains, let them throw millions of acres on us till our ground, singeing his pate against the burning zone, make us like a wart. Nay, and thou wilt mouth, I'll rant as well as thou. This is mere madness, and thus a while the fit will work on him. Anon, as patient as the female dove, when that her golden couplets are disclosed, his silence will sit drooping. Hear you, sir. What is the reason that you use me thus? I loved you ever, but it is no matter. Let Hercules himself do what he may. The cat will mew and a dog will have his day. I pray thee, good Horatio, wait upon him. Strengthen your patience in our last night's speech. We'll put the matter to the present push. Good Gertrude, get some water over your son. This grave shall have a living monument. An hour of quiet shortly shall we see, till then in patience our proceeding be. Act five, scene two. Elsinore, a hall in the castle. Enter Hamlet and Horatio. So much for this, sir. Now shall you see the other. Uh, you do remember all the circumstance. Remember it, my lord. Sir, in my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Methought I lay worse than the mutinies in the Bilbo's. Rashly, and praised be rashness for it, let us know our indiscretion sometimes serves us well when our deep clocks do pall, and that should learn us. There's a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will. That is most certain. Up from my cabin, my sea gown scarfed about me in the dark, groped I to find out them, had my desire, fingered their packet, and in fine withdrew to mine own room again, making so bold, my fears forgetting manners, to unseal their grand commission. Where I found Horatio, <laughs> royal knavery, an exact command, larded with many several sorts of reasons, importing Denmark's health and England's too, with who? Such bugs and goblins in my life, that on the supervised, no leisure baited, no, not to say the finding of the axe, my head should be struck off. Is it possible? Here's the commission. Read it at more leisure. But wilt thou bear me how I did proceed? I beseech you. Being thus benetted round with villainies, or I could make a prologue to my brain, they had begun the play. I sat me down, devised a new commission, wrote it fair. I once did hold it as our saddest do, a baseness to write fair, and labored much how to forget that learning. But, sir, now it did me yeoman's service. Wilt thou know the effect of what I wrote? Aye, good, my lord. An earnest conjuration from the king, as England was his faithful tributary, as love between them like the palm might flourish, as peace should still her wheaten garland wear, and stand a comma between their amities, and many such like as of great charge, that on the view and knowing of these contents, without debatement further, more or less, he should the bearers put to sudden death, not shriving time allowed. 
How was this sealed? Why, even in that, he was heaven ordinant. I had my father's signet in my purse, which was the model of that Danish seal, folded the writ up in the form of the other, subscribed it, gave it the impression, placed it safely, the changeling never known. Now, the next day was our sea fight, and what to this was sequent, thou knowest already. So Guildenstern and Rosencrantz go to it. Why, man, they did make love to this employment. They are not near my conscience. Their defeat does by their own insinuation grow. Tis dangerous when the baser nature comes between the pass and bell in sense of points of mighty opposites. Why, what a king this is this? Does it not, thinks thee, stand me now upon, he that hath killed my king and whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle for my proper life, and with such cousinage, is not perfect conscience to quit him with this arm, and is not to be damned to let this canker of our nature come in further evil. It must be shortly known to him from England. What is the issue of the business there? It will be short. The interim is mine, and a man's life is no more than to say one. But I am very sorry, good Horatio, that to Laertes I forgot myself, for by the image of my cause I see the portraiture of his. I'll court his favors, but sure the bravery of his grief did put me into towering passion. Peace, who comes there? Enter young Osric, a courtier. Your lordship is right welcome back to Denmark. I humbly thank you, sir. Dost thou know this waterfly? No, my good lord. Thy state is the more gracious, for tis a vice to know him. He had much land and fertile. Let a beast be lord of beasts, and his crib shall stand at the king's mess. Tis a chuck, but, as I say, spacious in the possession of dirt. Sweet lord, if your lordship were at leisure, I should impart a thing to you from his majesty. I will receive it, sir, with all diligence of spirit. Put your bonnet to his right use, tis for the head. I, I thank you, your lordship. It is very hot. <laughs> no, believe me, tis very cold. The wind is northerly. It is indifferent cold, my lord, indeed. But yet, methinks it is very sultry and hot for my complexion. Exceedingly, my lord, it is very sultry, as were. I cannot tell how, but my lord, his majesty bade me signify to you that he has laid a great wager on your head. Sir, this is the matter. Oh, I beseech you, remember. <laughs> Nay, Good, my lord, for mine ease and good faith, see, he, here is newly come to court Laertes. Believe me, an absolute German, full of the most excellent differences, very soft society, and great show. And indeed, to speak feelingly of him, he is the card or calendar of gentry, for you shall find in him the continent of what part a gentleman would see. Sir, his definement suffers no perdition in you. Though I know to divide him inventorially would dozy the arithmetic of memory, and yet but gnaw neither in respect of his quick sale. But in the verity of extolment, I take him to be a soul of great article, and his infusion of such dearth and rareness as to make true diction of him, his semblance is his mirror, and who else would trace him his umbrage, nothing more. Your lordship speaks most infallibly of him. The concernancy, sir. Why do we wrap the gentleman in our more raw breath? Sir? Is it not possible to understand another tongue? You'll do it, sir, really. What imports the nomination of this gentleman? Of Laertes? His purses are... Oh, that's right. His purse is empty already. All his golden words are spent. Of him, sir. I know you are not ignorant. I would you did, sir. Yet, in faith, if you did, it would not much approve me. Well, sir? You are not ignorant of what excellence Laertes is. I dare not confess that, lest I should compare with him in excellence. But to know a man well were to know himself. I, I, I mean, sir, for his weapon. But the, in the imputation laid on him by them in his medes unfellowed. What's his weapon? Rapier and dagger. That's two of his weapons, but well. The king, sir, hath wagered with him six Barbary horses, against the which he has impawned, as I take it, six French rapiers and poniards with their signs as girdles, hangers, and so forth. 
three of the carriages in faith are very dear to fancy, very responsible to the hills, most delicate carriages and very liberal of conceit. What call you the carriages? I knew you must be edified by the margent error you had done. The carriages, sir, are the hangers. The phrase would be more germane to the matter if we could carry cannon by our sides. I would it might be hangers till then. But on, six Barbary horses against six French swords, there are signs and three liberal conceited carriages. That's the French bet against the Danish. Why is this all imponed, as you call it? The king, sir, hath laid that in a dozen passes between yourself and him, he shall not exceed you three hits. He hath laid on twelve for nine, and it would come to immediate trial if your lordship would vouchsafe the answer. How if I answer no? I mean, my lord, the opposition of your person in trial. Sir, I will walk here in the hall. If it please his majesty, it is the breathing time of day with me. Let the foils be brought. The gentleman William and the king hold his purpose. I will win for him if I can. If not, I will gain nothing but my shame in the odd hits. Shall I re-deliver you even so? To this effect, sir, after what flourish your nature will. I commend my duty to your lordship. Yours, yours. He does well to commend it himself. There are no tongues else for stern. The slapwing runs away with the shell on his head. <laughs> he did comply with his dug before he sucked it. Thus has he and many more of the same bevy that I know the drossy age dotes on. Only got the tune of the time and outward habit of encounter a kind of yesty collection which carries them through and through to most fanned and winnowed opinions and do but blow them to their trial the bubbles are out my lord his majesty commended him to you by a young ostrick who brings back to him that you attend him in the hall he sends now to know if your pleasure hold to play with the artes or that you will take longer time I am constant to my purposes. They follow the king's pleasure. If his fitness speaks, mine is ready, now or whensoever, provided I be so able as now. The king and queen are coming down. In happy time. The queen desires you to use some gentle entertainment to Laertes before you fall to play. She well instructs me. You will lose this wager, my lord. I do not think so. Since he went into France, I have been in continual practice. I shall win at the odds. But thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart. But it is no matter. Nay, good, my lord. It is but foolery, but it is such a kind of gains giving as would perhaps trouble a woman. If your mind is like anything, obey it. I, I will forestall their repair hither and say you are not fit. Not a whit. We defy augury. There's a special providence in the fall of the sparrow. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Since no man knows aught of what he leaves, what is to lead betimes? Let be. Enter the king. The Queen, Laertes, Ostrich, Lords, with other attendants, with foils and gauntlets, a table of flagons of wine are placed upon it. Come, Hamlet, come and take this hand from me. Give me your pardon, sir. I have done you wrong, but pardon it as you are a gentleman. This presence knows, and you must needs have heard how I am punished with sore distraction, what I have done, that might your nature, honor, and exception roughly awake, I here proclaim was madness. Was Hamlet wronged Laertes? Never Hamlet. If Hamlet from himself be taken away, and when he's not himself does wrong Laertes, then Hamlet does it not. Hamlet denies it. And who does it then? His madness, if to be so, Hamlet is of the faction that is wronged. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. Sir, in this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil 
free me so far in your most generous thoughts that I have shot my arrow o'er the house and hurt my brother. I'm satisfied in nature, whose motive in this case should stir me most to my revenge. But in my terms of honor, I stand aloof and will know reconcilement till some elder masters of known honor, I have a voice and precedent of peace to keep my name ungorged. But till that time, I do receive your offered love like love and will not wrong it. I embrace it freely. And will this brother's wager frankly play? Uh, give us the foils, come on. Come, one for me. I'll be your foil, Laertes. In mine ignorance, your skill shall, like a star the darkest night, stick fiery off indeed. You mock me, sir. No, by this hand. Give them foils, young Osric, cousin Hamlet. You know the wager. Very well, my lord. Uh, your grace has laid the odds on the weaker side. I do not fear it. I have seen you both. But since he is bettered, we have therefore odds. This is too heavy. Uh, let, let me see another. This likes me well. These foils have all the length. Aye, my good lord. Set me the stoops of wine upon that table. If Hamlet give the first or second hit, or quit in answer of the third exchange, let all the battlements their ordinance fire. The king shall drink to Hamlet's better health, or better breath, and in the cup a union shall he throw, richer than that which four successive kings in Denmark's crown have worn. Give me the cups, and let the kettle to the trumpet speak. The trumpet to the cannoneer without, the cannons to the heavens, the heaven to the earth. Now, the king's drinks to Hamlet. Come, begin. And you, the judges, bear a wary eye. Come on, sir. Come, my lord. They play. One. No. Judgment. A hit. A very palpable hit. Well, again. They give me drink. Hamlet, this pearl is thine. Here's to thy health. Give him the cup. I'll play this bout first. I set it by a while. Come. Another hit. What say you? A touch. A touch. I do confess. Hmm. Our son shall win. He's fat. Scant of breath. Here, Hamlet, take my napkin. Rub thy brows. The queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet. Good madam. Gertrude, do not drink. I will, my lord. I pray you pardon me. It is the poison. Oh, it is too late. I dare not drink yet, madam. By and by. Come, let me wipe thy face. My lord, I'll hit him now. I do not think it. And yet, it is almost against my conscience. Come, for the third, Laertes, you but dally. Pray you pass with your best violence. I am afeard you make a wanton of me. Say you so? Come on, play. <sighs> Nothing neither way. Have at you now. <clears throat> Laertes oh. wounds Hamlet. Then, in scuffing, they change rapiers, and Hamlet <clears throat> wounds Laertes. Pot them, pot them, they are incensed. Nay, come again. The <sighs> queen falls. Look to the queen there, ho! They bleed on both sides. How is it, my lord? How is Laertes? Why, as a woodcock to mine own spring, Osric, I am justly killed with my own treachery. How does the queen? She sounds to see them bleed. No, no. The drink. The drink. Oh, my dear Hamlet, the drink. The drink. I am poisoned. Oh, villainy! Oh, let the door be locked! Treachery, seek it out! It is here, Hamlet. Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee there is not a half hour of life. The treacherous instrument, instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed. The foul practice has turned itself on me. Lo, 
Here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poison. I can no more. The king. The king's to blame. The point in venom too. Then venom to thy work. <sighs> treason. Treason. treason! 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 Oh, yet defend me, friends. I am but hurt. Hear thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane. Drink off this potion. Is thy union here? Follow my mother. Oh, 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 he, is, he is justly served. It is a poison tempered by himself. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. And then make thee free of it. I follow thee. I am dead, Horatio. Wretched queen, adieu. You that look pale and tremble at this chance, that are but mutes or audience to this act. Had I but time, as this spell sergeant death is strict in his arrest, oh, I could tell you. But let it be. Horatio, I am dead. Thou livest, report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. Never believe it. I am more an antique Roman than a Dane. Here's yet some liquor left. As thou art a man, give me the cup. Let go. By heaven, I'll have it. Oh, good Horatio, what a wounded name. Things standing thus unknown shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. What warlike noise is this? Young Fortinbras, the conquest come from Poland to the ambassadors of England, gives this warlike volley. Will I die, Horatio? The potent poison quite o'ercrows my spirit. I cannot live to hear the news from England, but I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice, so tell him with the occurrence more and less which have solicited. The rest is silence. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Why does the drum come hither? Enter Enter. Fortinbras. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Enter Fortinbras and English ambassadors with drum, colors, and attendants, because they can't go anywhere by themselves. Where is this sight? What is it you will see if aught of war wonder cease your search? This quarry cries on havoc. O proud death, what feast is toward in thine eternal cell that thou so many princes at a shot hath so bloodily hath struck. The sight is dismal, and our affairs from England come too late. The ears are senseless that would give us hearing to tell him his commandment is fulfilled, that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Where should we have our thanks? Not from his mouth. How did the ability of life to thank you? He never gave commandment for the death. But since, so jump upon this bloody question. You from the Pollock Wars and you from England are here arrived. Give order that these bodies high on a stage be placed to the view. And let me speak to the yet unknowing world how these things came about. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts, of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause. And in this upshot, Purposes mistook fallen on the adventurous heads. All this can I truly deliver. Let us haste to hear it and call the noblest to the audience. For me, with sorrow, I embrace my fortune. I have some rights of memory in this kingdom, which now to claim my vantage doth invite me. Of that I shall, have, shall also cause to speak. And from his mouth, who will draw on more, but let the same be presently performed, even while men's minds are wild, lest more mischance of plots and errors happen. 
Let four captains bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage, for he was likely, has he been put on, to have proved most royally, and for his passage, the soldiers' music and rights of war speak loudly for him. Take up the bodies. Such a sight as this becomes the field, for here shows much amiss. Go, bid the sh soldiers shoot. Excellent. Marching. After the witch, a peal of ordnance is shot off. And with that, the curtain falls on Hamlet the Dane. Yay! Yay! We Thank did you. it! We did it! Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here. Uh, we'll go around and everyone feel free to plug whatever you want. Cass, feel free to put your links in chat. We're going to go in reverse order, starting with Pope. Cope, thank you yet again for coming. Thank you also again for your dulcet tones and the introductions that you provide. We are so happy to have them. I, I am happy to help in any way, shape, or form. Hey, everybody. Pope here. Pope World Bill on Twitter. Pope World Bill on Twitch. I lurk in all your streams. Uh, if you want to see more of this kind of ridiculous contorted face, uh, you get a couple of chances, some which I can't quite talk about just yet. Um, but this Sunday... Uh, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern over on Other Doc's channel. Uh, we're getting down with Weird War 2. Uh, it's it's going to be a time. It's Savage Worlds. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, the Deadlands stream that uh, Jam ran over on Tales from the Grim, you might be familiar somewhat with this character archetype I'm playing. Um, and then over uh, later... That same evening, 9.30 Eastern, over on Matt 7s channel, we get down with Neon in the dreadful beat of DJ Strahd. Oh, it's going to get weird, folks. It's going to get weird. As Van Helsong is wandering around, there are killer clowns. It's Baravia. It's strange. Come have a weird mind-tripping time. Uh, until we meet again, I want to thank you all so much, those of you here with us live watching on YouTube, watch the VOD, wherever you are, you are as much a part of this theater, this space as we are. And I thank you all for it. Love you all. Take care. See you soon. Thank you yet again, Pope. Tanya, Tanya, thank you for coming. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome. Um, my name is Tanya, I for Tier everywhere online. Uh, this Sunday, you can catch my Rebels Waterdeep season six finale over at twitch.tv backslash dnb and on thursdays for the next few weeks you can catch me over at wandering dm's channel where i'm gming dragon age along with uh deidre as one of our sneaky sneaky stabby stabby characters verisa um that is over at the wandering dm's channel and uh otherwise you can find me online and occasionally i stream on twitch when i remember it exists so well, we thank you for coming, and I also thank you for uh, GMing our shenanigans over on uh, Dragon Age, because <laughs> that is just so much fun, and I love it every minute. Uh, Yay. And then, Billy! Billy, my friend! Thank you again! Hello! Uh, this was a hoot. Um, I love doing this, too. It's like, you get to meet new people, you get to make new relationships, you get to exercise your brain. And then, uh, all, like, during all of our little intermissions, we're sitting here talking about, like, a, like, sh like sh different facets of different characters, how it relates to this and that. And it, it's just super cool. It's really mind-expanding. And I'm not even high. Um, uh, if you want to follow me on the internet, I'm at Bill of the Forest on Tales from the Grim on Wednesday evening. Um, I'm uh, in a Witcher campaign with... Uh, Deirdre, and hopefully uh, Trooper again soon. Um, uh, that'll be Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern. It's a hell of a lot of fun. And then on Tuesdays at 7.30 Eastern, doing a Simba Room game on WebDM's channel. Um, so if you like those things, come check me out. If you don't, also fine. Well, I appreciate that. And yes, we'll be back. I can't wait for the next thing to happen over on Witcher. Both of these things will happen. Trooper! Hi. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him. He was like a weirdo. Um, it was, <laughs> this, was, this was so lovely. Thank you so much. I, I'm so happy to, to do these classics on Twitch, and I appreciate you, Prax, for putting them together and putting together such cool casts, and I really love 
being able to interact with new people I've never met before. It's such a joy. I hope the the I hope you all in the audience enjoyed as much as as I do. Um, uh, everybody's dead, and apparently Fortinbras just takes everything because he was just like, well, everybody's dead. I suppose it's me. Ta-da! Uh, <laughs> convenient for him, I suppose. Uh, you can find me at uh, Academic Foxhole on Twitter if you want to hang out and find me there, or you can find me at Trooper SJP here on Twitch. Uh, when it comes to RPGs on Fridays at 7 p.m., uh, which is today, today's Friday, on my channel, I run a fate French resistance campaign called City of Light and Shadow, and you can jump in today if you like. Uh, you can also find me, I, I, you know, the semester's ending, so I'm doing lots of RPs, RPGs, uh, Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern over at Tales from the Grim. I will be in a short four-part uh, capers off-world game called Seraphim Station run by uh, Tales from the Grim, uh, Grimjack. And then you can find me on Wednesdays now over at Little Red Dot's channel for uh, Overlight, an, Ova, an Overlight campaign uh, called Nova. And um, that's all I can tell you. That's all I can tell you for the moment. There may be other things, but I cannot tell you. That's all. That's me. Well, yes. Go follow, go follow Trooper. They, you know, all the fun things. Lauren. Lauren, thank you for being Hamlet. I had so much fun. Thanks for putting this all together, Prax. It was an absolute joy. I am Lauren. I'm that salty ginger over on Twitter and half of Salty Sweet Games with my best friend Kiana here on Twitch. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, uh, 12 p.m. Pacific, we have our Pulp Cthulhu game, Masks of Nyarlathotep. We're transitioning out of the prologue, going to do some uh, character uh, development and then getting into New York and the campaign proper, which is super exciting. Um, and on Sundays, we have a Witcher game, except it's all, you know, di disaster queer babies, as it should be. And that's at 8 a.m. Pacific for some ungodly reason. I decided to put it there. Um, otherwise, uh, you can catch me on Off the Table, the Scraticus Academy, and Nomadic for something really cool coming up. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being here. As for me, you all know me. I'm at Dear Drummer on Twitter or Praxcore Thesmophoria, as you see me around Twitch. And uh, we will be back. You can find me tonight over on Wandering DM for Cyberpunk um, Red, where I will hopefully not get shot. Fingers crossed. I mean, I'm the only character that's gotten shot in every combat, so. Why are you shooting at the medic? Or not the medic, the mechanic. That just seems mean. The mechanic doesn't have a gun. Why do you shoot at the mechanic? But because they don't have a gun, right? I mean, like, like you can't shoot back. I feel like that's why you shoot at the mechanic. That just seems mean. Um, but other than that, uh, check my Twitter, because I post where I'm going to be. And uh, as for the channel here, we'll be back next week. And we did Shakespeare this week. So next week, we're going to do a week of classical drama. We are going to begin... Uh, with a trilogy of tragedies, we are going to do the complete Arrestiad, which, if you don't know, is basically Game of Thrones times ten meets Ancient Greece. It'll be great. It'll be fun. I'll be posting all about this as my Twitter. Thank you so much. And thank you all of you people for being here. I really appreciate all of you coming to play in this little world, the little thing that I've been trying to do. Um, as Billy's camera goes crazy. Um, and um, I will also say that if you've missed an ep uh, missed the live performance, I am figuring out this YouTube thing. All of these are going up as VODs on YouTube. There's a link in chat that you should be able to work and find, hopefully. If it doesn't work, someone let me know. <laughs> Just. But um, other than that, keep posted. And as we say, although the curtain may fall on this performance, we'll rise again for the next one. Have a wonderful night, y'all, and see you next time.